The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, spending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather one, in one place. This public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on a link on the town webpage. According, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with the roll call of the members of the ZBA. Steve Judge is here. <clears throat> Mr. Langsdale? Here. Ms. O'Meara? Here. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here and the associate members of the ZBA, Ms. Waldman, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Greeny. Here. And Mr. Meadows. Here. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, uh, planner, uh, Dave Washevitz, building inspector. And I'm not sure if we'll see uh, Rob Mora uh, later on in the, in the meeting. The Zoning Board is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaws is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and they're recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits. The board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for the special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for its to, to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight, we have the following agenda. A public meeting on ZBA FY 2020-14, Herbology Group Inc for the review and or approval of a proposed de minimis change to the previously approved sign detail pursuant to condition 21 of the previously approved special permits ZBA FY 2019-13 and ZBA FY 2019-14 located at 422 Amity Street, map 13B, parcel eight, limited business BL zoning district and research and development RD Overlay District. Public hearing on ZBA FY 2021-06, Backyard ADUs. Request a special permit to allow a supplemental detached dwelling unit as an accessory to a one family detached dwelling under section 5.0111 and 
of the zoning bylaw located at 34 Baker Street, map 13D, parcel 46, neighborhood residence, RN zoning district. This is continued from December 10th, 2020. And ZBA FY 2021-03, Pioneer Property Services, LLC, requests a special permit to convert the existing detached garage to a residential unit, which will increase the number of residential units converted dwelling from one to two under sections 3.3241, 9.22, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 275 East Pleasant Street, map 11B, parcel 63, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. This is continued from our January 28th, 2020 meeting. The general public, we also have a general public comment period following this business, as well as an opportunity for other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. The first item of business tonight is ZBA FY 2020-14, Herbology Group Inc. for the review and or approval of a proposed de minimis change to a previously approved sign detail pursuant to condition 21 of the previously approved special permits, ZBA FY 2019-13 and ZBA FY 2019-14, located at 422 Amity Street, Map 13B, Parcel 18, Limited Business, BL Zoning District and Research and Development Overlay. Are there any disclosures from members of the board? I wanna go through the submissions that we've received regarding this matter. We have received a submission from um, Amanda, an email from Amanda Pfeiffer responding to emails from uh, Ms. Pollock. That email uh, details the um, pro other material that they sent. We've received a sign of the, uh, the draft of the existing approved sign out in front that's proposed to be changed. We've received a set of updated site plans, 10 pages of those dated June um, approved. These are the approved site plans from June of 2019. We have received a um, mock-up of the planned sign, um, two pages that we received, I think on January 28th, I think, or February 3rd, I think February 3rd. Um, the plan mock-up items two and three. I don't think there are any other submissions public or uh, from, and there are no staff submissions at this point in time. Is that correct, Maureen? That is correct. Um, who's presenting for the applicant? Uh, we have uh, Harry, I'm not gonna say your last name. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, uh, Harry Auerbach with Agnoli Sign. We're located at 722 Worthington Street in Springfield. All right, Mr. Arbach. Um, before we start, we also have Mr. Mora has is he's also in attendance here. Um, Mr. Arbach, go ahead and present your. Thank you, your um, Maureen. Uh, I believe you wanted me to share some um, documents, if you will, and I think to do that, I need to be a co-host. Is that correct, or should I just go into the presentation? How uh, I think you're. Uh, could you? You should be able to uh, share your screen. I will do my best. Yeah, it, it uh, so for the purposes for the board, uh, it would be nice to see what you're proposing. Of course, um, bear with me. At times I'm a Zoom novice. So here we go. Hopefully the, the board can see this. Um, and please tell me if you can. Um, this was the original. Um, proposed approved sign. Um, it was made out, it, well, it was going to be made out of wood and external, externally illuminate, illuminated. Um, and this is the new sign. Um, the, again, the difference between in terms is the materials. Uh, this is now an aluminum sign. The, uh, and it's internally illuminated with LEDs. The granite post exist now um, and will be used uh, for the new sign. So again, the, the difference between the, what, what was approved and what is we're seeking approval for is wood now versus aluminum. We want to use aluminum, externally illuminated, now internally illuminated. I'm so sorry. Um, and 
Pardon me. <laughs> Too much technology. There we go. Uh, I, I apologize. Any questions? This is the same size as the previously approved. As the Thank approved you. Plan. Yes, the same size as previously approved. Again, the the granite posts exist. The sign will be uh, fitted between the two posts. Um, in terms of, in terms of that method, um, and um, it's important to point out uh, with the internal illumination on your on the screen, if you will, um, the only part of the sign that will illuminate is the logo and the letters. That is the only part because what is in, what is green is aluminum and therefore not and will not illuminate. We call that in our terminology. These are push through. Uh, letters and logo. It's a piece of acrylic that pushes through the, uh, the the aluminum sign. One question I have is, how was the old, the currently approved plan lit? Uh, that would, would have been grounded. Uh, that would have been grounded illumination. Grounded, um, and, and going and up, and shooting up, and and what's really yeah. interesting, you know, many times actually in in a neighboring town in Hadley. They want, you know, they want external illumination, which actually causes more light to spill. This will be actually less light spilling out. Thank you. There are questions from board members. Mr. Meadows, how will uh, how will the lights be controlled? Uh, they're typically on a timer um, and, and and controlled from the inside. And uh, you know, when I attend meetings like this. Uh, you know, many times, or I will, will, the board will tell us what to do. And typically, it goes on a little before dusk and stays on a, an hour or two after the business closes to allow people to to egress, if you will. I mean, it's not a source of illumination, you know, to the cars, but it, it, it a timer. So the 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 uh, timer was going to have to be um, changed fairly regularly in order to keep up with daylight? Yeah, you know, again, with the change of seasons, uh, Eastern Standard Time or going to daylight savings, um, you, know, we just, you just move it back, if you will. Would it, would it be possible to put it on a photo sensor so it'll go on when, uh, when there isn't enough light and, and then you can put a timer onto it so it turns off at a specific time at night? It, that could be an option. Um, this is, uh, you know, I'd have to discuss with the owners as to it, it's not the, there's no photo sensor on the current sign. Um, but if that's a, a requirement or a request, um, and actually now that I'm saying that sometimes the photo sensor can be by the building. So it's, you know, sure. when, yeah. so yes, that, that could be an option. Other questions from board members? Judge. Mr. Langsdale. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I did not receive the um, uh, printed materials uh, for this meeting tonight. Yes. So I don't have the picture of the uh, originally original uh, approved sign. Um, but it seems to me that the name has been changed. Is that of concern to us? And should it be? Uh, good point. I, yeah, keep, uh, Mr. Langsdale, you're not, we, none of us received the, the packet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it was, it was um, mailed out Monday and none of us have gotten the, the meeting package. This, um, what you see in front of you here is the, is the existing approved um, mm -hmm. sign. So I, I why is the name, did the company change its name? Yes, the company did change its name um, from, well, Pleasantries is a subsidiary of Herbology and um, bear with me for a second. Um, I can try to be specific about this in, in, in a letter to Ms. Pollock from my colleague, um, Amanda, dated February 4, um, RG, um, RJB Enterprises is the operational equivalent of Pleasantries Inc. 
FA, FKA, formerly known as Herbology Group. Okay. So it's a name change, not ownership change. And any, any change of ownership that is um, notifications that are required by the state laws have been taken care of, I'm assuming. Yeah, um, I mean- you're, you're a lighting guy, you're not, the, you're not their lawyer, so. That is, that is true, but having done a number of cannabis um, entities, you, you, if you change the ownership groups, it's a whole nother story with the CCC. Yep. So yep. Uh, I can say fairly confidently that, you know, same owner group, just a different name. Um, are there other places where signage needs to be changed because of the name change on the building? Uh, there is a second location and allow me to bring that up if I can. Um, da, da, da. Bear with me. <clears throat> so in this area, the, the pleasantry name will, will go there as well. Um, I don't have a, a PDF of that per se, but it will also be pleasantries. Um, so I'm assuming Mr. Auerbach that we had, a, we had an approved sign. Uh, we, were, we had a plan that had the sign on it, which was approved. Mm -hmm. And that if you're going to put something different up here, I suspect you don't need to do the same process that we're doing tonight for that sign. Right. Mr. My Moore, is that correct? My understanding is the sign that was was approved there did not change in terms of its material structure. It's only in name. Okay, so Mr. Moore, maybe you can tell me if we need to have a separate consideration of a uh, de minimis change there. So there's, um, there's different types of de minimis change, the ones that I approve and the ones that get sent to the board. Uh, yep. As long as uh, it's limited to the name of the establishment changing, which we are finding to be pretty common with the, uh, the, the marijuana establishments so far, uh, or not unusual for them to change name through the prior to opening even. Uh, the reason we decided to send you the, uh, the freestanding sign is because of the addition of the internal lights, mm -hmm. uh, the illumination internally. Uh, which was different and uh, suspected that just as we've heard so far, the, the, the line of questioning would be important to the board. Uh, but simply name change uh, substantially similar to what was originally approved would be something that we would generally just approve uh, without sending to the board. Thank you. Are there other questions from board members? Sure. I don't, is there a hand up? Mr. Mac Maxfield. Uh, I guess my question here, it's more just procedural, I guess, from our end here on um, de minimis change. And I guess my understanding of, of de minimis change uh, was, and I, I guess I could be wrong about this, was minimis change is it's, it's coming to ask us if this change is, um, it's, it's essentially, does it warrant that we were asking if whether or not this warrants revisiting the whole application in, in the first place is essentially what we're, we're, we're asking with a de minimis for change. So if we said, no, this is not a de minimis change, that would mean that the applicant would have to submit these new plans to us, then we'd have to approve these plans. Or if we would say, no, this is not a de minimis change, that's us saying they're, they're not allowed to do it entirely. Uh, procedurally, uh, how, how would that work here? So I guess I, I, I just to, to, to elaborate, I guess, to, to make it a little bit more yep. clear. Uh, my understanding of the minimus change is essentially that we're uh, saying, if we say, yes, it's a min de minimis change, it's essentially the same as us saying it doesn't require uh, input from the ZBA and we're, we're concurring with that is what my understanding of de minimis change was. Am I, am I mistaken about that, that we are saying there is a change and you're we're just approving it? I think that there's... I, I, maybe Mr. Moore can help here, but I think there's, as he said, there's two kinds of de minimis change. They make, some, they make decisions to allow for change that's very de minimis and they don't think has to come to the ZBA for approval. This because of our interest in lighting and uh, light wash and um, 
down and making sure that things are downcast and not um, light uh, spreading or uh, light spreading beyond the, the sign itself is an issue which we take um, interest in on the ZBA. And I think for that reason, they said, came to us and said, this might be a, this is something you should look at. Um, and you can vote as a ZBA to permit this just in a public meeting with a, um, or if we reject it, then they'd have to come back with, and they wanted to change the sign, they'd have to come back with either another de minimis change or they'd have to come back into a public hearing. And is that right, Mr. Mora, or did I um, make a mistake there? No, no, that's correct. I think, you know, what's really um, uh, helpful to think about is whether or not the change is big enough to require a modification of the special permit. And really that wants to be done when the board feels like they really need to put conditions into the special permit that they don't have now. Uh, because you can't add a condition during a public meeting like this. But you can rely on the applicant's submission, their management plan and the testimony that they provide that'll get captured in the meeting summary. So I think in the first step to, you know, to decide, you know, do you even want to consider this, this proposal or do you think it's completely you know, inappropriate for the application? And you know, if that's the case that it's inappropriate, then you simply would say no we cannot approve this as a de minimis change. And then it's up to the applicant to submit a formal application to the amend the special permit. But if you find that it's appropriate and could be considered small enough of a change, not significant enough to need a special permit modification, then you can go ahead and approve it and try to capture the things that are important that we can, we can read in the meeting summary and ensure that the, uh, the applicant does during the installation or construction. So that would mean that Mr. Meadows' concern or suggestion for um, a photovoltaic cell to allow for on or off could be recognized through or could be acknowledged in the um, in the meeting summary in the meeting notes, and that's something that the that would um, be kind of like a kind of like a condition on the the change here because it would be mentioned in the notes. Is that right? That's right. So you know it is important with meeting summaries. Uh, or public meetings to be as clear as you can about what you'd like to see and what makes it uh, that, that the minimus change that you approved so that we can see that when we're at the permitting stage because what we're gonna ask for is uh, you know, that detail, that photo cell or time of uh, operation, uh, we're gonna ask for that at the time of the building permit application uh, and make that a condition of the permit to ensure that it actually happens. Uh, where we won't have years later, we won't have this special permit condition to rely on that somebody could could pull out and find. It's it's got to be done right uh, at the time of installation. So um, you know some some public meeting approvals don't come with any conditions or any additional information, which is fine. That's just the way the applicant submitted. But if you want to make uh, something uh, you know changed about the application, uh, we want to try to ca capture that in the meeting summary as best we can. Thank you. Other questions or comments from board members? I had one, are there other lit signs um, along, internally lit signs along um, um, University Drive there? I know there's none on Amity Street um, going south, I guess, um, but are there any other signs lit like this along and along uh, University Drive, Maureen. Uh, just anecdotally, I would, I would say that CVS is lit, um, and perhaps and think, uh, the sign. Uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't confidently say one way or the other. Um, I think the big Y. What as about well? the other marijuana establishment that's down the road? I think they have a lit sign as well. Is that right? I can't recall the top of my head to be perfectly yeah. honest. Okay. That's my recollection, but I can't remember either. And then uh, of course, um, Hooley Dickinson mm -hmm. uh, on right. University Drive, uh, their sign is, is, is internally lit as well. That's right. Okay, thank you. Ms. Parks. 
I do think this is a de minimis change and I don't think we should require a uh, light sensor. Any other comments? Mr. Langsdale. Is this the same size as the one that we approved? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? All right, this requires a vote by the board to approve the de minimis change. Maureen, who serves on the panel for this item? Uh, let's see here. I have listed uh, Steve, Keith, Tammy, Dylan, and Greg. And Greg, okay. Craig, sorry. Craig, Mr. Meadows, yep. All right. Is there a motion to approve the, this um, de minimis change? So moved. Mr. Maxfield, seconded by Mrs. Parks. Yes. Is there any discussion on the motion? Mr. Langsdale. Yeah, um, Ms. Parks has already stated that she thinks we should not have a, uh, uh, what, what we were talking about requesting, uh, but we haven't discussed that. So this is the place to do it. Um, yep. What are we in fact voting on? Well, if you'd like to amend the vote, the motion to, in, or Mr. Meadows wants to amend the motion to, to include a um, photovoltaic timer, this would be the place to do that. The motion before us right now is to approve it as submitted, which doesn't include the, the, the timer. If you want that if, to be uh, included, this is the time to do that as a, a motion to amend the motion. I would like to see it with a photovoltaic uh, to turn it on and a timer to turn it off. Is there a second to his motion? I second that. All right, we have a, a second to the, the amendment. Uh, so the, the, the motion before the body is an amendment to the, to the underlying motion to require a photovoltaic and a timer as stated by Mr. Meadows. Is there any discussion regarding that? Mr. Maxfield. Um, I guess my question here is, can we, again, procedurally, can we, can we put conditions like that in a, in a vote for approving a de minimis change? Uh, Mr. Mora. So you're not able to add a condition to the special permit, but you're advising us, the, the building inspectors that are going to issue the building permit uh, for this installation. And if you're comfortable doing that and keeping it as a public meeting item, um, I think what you'll, you'll know historically what we would do is make that a condition of the building permit based on your recommendations. Uh, so we do, you know, we do follow through with that. So you should feel comfortable with that if, if um, for, for small items like this. I did want to add though, uh, with that, um, that sort of um, recommendation for the uh, photo cell and timer that um, if the board was concerned, I think the applicant said that the turnoff time would be about an hour after closing. Uh, so those are the kind of details that are helpful for us. Uh, you know, not, not going off at midnight, going off, you know, after they close at eight or nine o'clock, you know, to understand that if that was uh, important to the board. Thank you. Um, Ms. Parks, you did you have um, did you want to share anything? Why you would oppose the motion to have a timer and a photovoltaic cell? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think that they mentioned that there would be a timer, and so I don't think that the addition of the photo sensor is necessary. I'm, I'm not sure how you would set it up. Also, if um, wouldn't that cause it to go on at, uh, at dawn or dusk and not when the business closed? If I may explain. Yes, Mr. Meadows. We, when we're looking at projects, 
we we often have it such that there's a photoelectric uh, cell that turns lights on so that it, they turn on when it begins to get dusk and then a timer to make sure that it turns off at a specific time in the evening rather than stays on. And what this does is it saves energy because if you have to manually change the timing as, as the year goes on, you can overshoot it one way or the other um, as far as turning it on is concerned. Whereas the photo cell turns it on automatically when the lighting is needed. And it's not turned on during the day that way, when it's daylight. Exactly. So you have the advantages of both, I understand. And that's something that the, um, the applicant can do, is that right, Mr. Auerbach? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, and you, or you can help with the installation well, of such a sensor. As Mr. Moore, as Mr. Moore said, you know, it, it would be a condition of the, of the permit and I would work with the manufacturer and the, the applicant to say this is a condition of the permit and that we need to have a photo cell somewhere on the building that uh, to Mr. Meadows' uh, explanation, you know, it goes on at dusk, turns it on at dusk and then a specific time to turn off at night. So an hour after closing or something like that, right? Is that what we're talking about? Um, let's give the, let's give the um, staff as much guidance as we possibly can. I think an hour after closing sounds like a reasonable time. You know, I, I have to take the board's <laughs> direction. Yeah, so. right. We, we can pick it. Got it. So we uh, would shut off. So for um, what would the dawn to one hour after? After closing, and that, that's typical of, of other municipalities, in, you know, near Amherst, um, you know, and again, it just allows it allows the the personnel to to egress and yeah, properly. and and just to repeat, yeah. one hour after the closing of the business, correct, yes. right. And if I may one say, you know, I, I don't know the particular hours, but some some businesses, you know, in, you know, Monday through Friday, it's nine o'clock Saturday and Sunday it's 10 o'clock so you usually defer to the later period time period so you're not bouncing back and forth um you know I, and again I can't speak to the, the hours there yet I I'm sure that you can find a sophisticated enough timer to give you seven days of various time point taken yep okay. yep and I think it's eight o'clock is the timing of the close for most of the marijuana facilities in Amherst so um I thought it um, I think we're about ready to vote, but I did see Mr. Maxfield raise your hand. Uh, yeah, because we're, we're still just talking about the, the motion uh, the, to amend, to amend uh, which I am definitely going to be voting no on. I just think I, I don't know if we have uh, procedurally, if we should be making uh, conditions on changes for uh, proving de minimis changes. Um, I'm sure we could do it, and I'm sure it wouldn't get challenged by anybody, but I, I don't I don't think we should be putting on a condition for, for a vote for de minimis change. I think we should just uh, leave that to uh, the building inspector or we should say, no, it's not a de minimis change. We want to add this condition of uh, a light sensor is, is how I think we should approach this and, and not put a condition on the uh, de minimis change. All right. Um, Mr. Mora. Is your hand up? Yes. So just in response to Mr. Maxfield, I, I, I think what the board could do if they wanted to and, and decided the same, ended up having the same opinion, is that you'd advise the applicant to uh, come back next meeting with the documentation, you know, supporting what you're asking for tonight. Uh, so the applicant gets an understanding of what you could or would approve in a public meeting. Uh, that is, if you were uncomfortable with the, uh, the meeting summary, capturing it and relying on a condition of a building permit, uh, then you would have the applicant adjust their, their materials to, to re reflect that. That just seems to be more of a burden on the, we get the same result probably, but more of a burden on the applicant. If I may, am I allowed to comment or not during this time? Well, if you have something to, yes, to add, I, I, yeah, I, I, th I know. From, I, a, from the applicant standpoint, as opposed to yeah, from the applicant standpoint, about the motion, we, we would obviously, if we need to do a photo cell, we will do a photo cell. 
Um, and okay. um, if, you know, if, if we could, to your point, if we could save time coming back again, because uh, obviously they would like to move forward with the project, um, yeah. you know, as quickly as possible. So if we could, if everybody knows that the building, you know, if Mr. Moore says it's in the, you know, to get the permit you must do, we will do. Got it. All right, Mr. Langsdale. Um, I, I think it's important that we understand that we're not putting a condition on this. We're putting, we're doing a recommendation to Mr. Mora so that he can put a condition on the building permit. That's different than us putting a condition on this uh, public, on this uh, hearing, a uh, public meeting uh, de minimis change. Um, so I just think it's important to make that distinction. Agreed. Good point. And Mr. Maxfield. So the motion before us is to make a recommendation about this then? That's, that's all this motion is? The motion is, the motion is to approve, the underlying motion is to approve the de minimis change. There's an amendment that before us to amend that motion to sit, to um, recommend or to con, to advise staff that a photovoltaic timer and um, sensor be placed on the on it, and that that sensor go off at uh, one hour after closing. That the okay. to put the light. So that's that's the motion before us right now is the is the amendment to the underlying motion. And that amendment is simply advisory. All right, then, then I'm, I'm ready to move forward. Thank you. you bet. All right, Ms. Parks. I'm sorry, so we're, so is this, so if we voted for this, is, is Mr. Moore then required to, uh, is that then required? I guess, I, I guess what Mr. Maxwell was saying is, is, is there a difference between recommended and required? I think practically he's going to, they're going to do it if it, but Mr. Moore, how do you view it? I mean, it seems to me that this is, that if the board votes, that this is our, this is our preference, you're going to, you're going to implement that. Right. I, I think no matter what we get to the same place, but um, you know, the, the motion and the decision of the board is that we find this a de minimis change provided that a photo cell and a timer uh, at, you know, cut off at one hour past closing time. Um, and, and then if I got something different for an application, it wouldn't be the de minimis change that the board approved. And I would say, you've, you've provided me something different. It's like if they came in with a sign five square feet bigger, I would say that wasn't the, the, the sign that the board approved. And, and they would have a choice to make. They either come back to the board and with a new ch new change to the sign, or they make the adjustments based on what happened to at tonight's meeting. So I think it, it really doesn't matter to me whether it says recommended or just says, you know, basically acknowledging that there will be a photo cell, there will be a timer that, that shuts off an hour after closing. And therefore we find that it's a de minimis change and does not uh, require any other uh, modification to the special permit. Yes, Ms. Parks. So again, you are requesting or you're requiring on the building permit. So you, so if we made this, if we vote to say yes, are you requiring this? I am requiring it. If if okay. if this vote is based on the installation of a photo cell and a timer, that's going to be a requirement of the building permit installation. Okay. So I think we're clear on what's before us. The first vote will be on the motion to amend the underlying motion to require the photo take timer, which shuts off an hour after closing. Do I have a motion to approve that amendment? So moved. Second. 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 All uh, this roll call vote. Mr. Judge, aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. Parks. No. Mr. Meadows. Aye. One, two, three, four. We've got four ayes and one nay. No, you don't have to pass. Yet. 
What's Max that? Oh, Mr. Maxfield, I thought you voted. Mr. Maxfield, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. Uh, just we'll, we'll keep moving, but just with the, the language the, fire, I'm voting nay. Well, uh, so you voted nay. So we have th we have uh, three to two. We need a vote of four, I think, to pass this uh, for any any item. So that motion fails. That amendment fails. Now the vote occurs, Mr. Let me just set, tell everybody where we're at. The vote now occurs, the, the discussion is on the underlying motion to approve the de minimis change. Mr. Maxfield. I, I'm, I'm just gonna make the motion just to, that, that we advise to, for the installation of the, of the cell. And then we can, we can vote on that. I think we'll have the votes and we can just move forward. I, I, I just don't want it to be required. The building inspector can require it, we can advise it. That's what we just voted on. No, we, yeah. we, we just voted on to require. No, we didn't. To require him. No, we we, we, the, the, the motion was to put that as part of the approval. That requires Mr. Mora to, to implement that. We didn't make the requirement ourselves. We told Mr. Mora that that's what we'd like to see. But if, you, if we just advise him, he's going to do the same thing. So either way, we're in the same, we're in the same place. Right. Well, I, yeah, I think we can move forward. I think we're we're all getting to the same place. We're getting bogged down in the bureaucracy. So I think we can we can uh, go ahead and move no forward with, what we want with just the just the motion uh, ahead of us right so, now. So, so the motion ahead of us now is just to approve the um, the de minimis change without any instruction to the staff on a full votate or a timer. That's what's before us now. We just that vote just lost because we need four. So right now it's the plain motion unamended. Any discussion? Oh, Mr. Washevitz. Um, I don't know if this would be agreeable, but maybe the should um, consider. So what's before the board is this is a de minimis change. And I would suggest perhaps it's a de minimis, de minimis change with the understanding that the uh, the installer will um, install the photovoltaic um, sensor and and the the, the shutoff um, or timer, um, and and that's all it is. So anything outside of that, you would perhaps want to consider it not a de minimis change. Does that does that help but, at all? Or? No, it's just well, it, it you know it 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 helps in the absence of a vote that just voted against that. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking to you guys to how you're gonna, how you're gonna implement what it seems to be a, um, not how you would implement this. Cause right now we have a, the legislative history on this is a defeated motion to, to um, suggest that to the staff. Now we can all say, if we all would, would say this in some other way, I guess we could possibly do it. But right now that's what's out there um, is it, it, it's, not no instruction to the staff. I think from the motion that just failed, the amendment that just failed. So the motion before us is to approve this in a de minimis way without it, and there is no other instructions to the staff. That's that's what's there. All right. Do I have them? Is there any other discussion before we move on? Ms. Parks. I just want to say that there is a timer. It's, it's, you know, there, that was discussed as, mm -hmm. as part of the lighting for the sign. So it's not that we're removing a timer from, from this. It's, it's just the uh, light sensor. That's, I guess that's right. Uh, there's a, Quiet. there is already a timer. Yep. There's already a timer on it. Is that, I mean, I, I know we're in the middle of a vote, but I want to make sure that's correct. Mr. Arbach, is there a timer on it currently? I, I, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but there will be. I mean, okay. uh, there right. has to be because the boy, you know. The, Otherwise, how do you? You're not going to have it on 24 seven. There has correct. to be. Yeah, no, that Got would it. be foolish. Right. And you know, listening to the board, the board is saying uh, either, and I'm not sure the procedurals, but the suggestion has come up. We're good. We're, We're good. good. No, you answered my question. We're in the middle of a vote, so I don't want to extend more discussion. All right, Mr. Langsdale. 
Okay, my problem is that the Mr. Auerbach says that there will be a timer, but we don't know what that timer is. So we don't know at this point what we're voting on as a de minimis change. That's my thought on this. Okay, so it looks to me that we've got um, the following issues before us. One, we can pass this and leave it up to um, staff to decide whether what's the um, appropriate timing. Um, we, I don't think we have direction to staff, although Mr. Washevitz made a <laughs> valiant effort. There's not direction to staff <clears throat> to try to put on a, a, full, a photovoltaic timer on the, on the um, uh, sign. So we can either approve this with nothing except the existence of the undetermined timer, or we can ask the applicant to withdraw this and come back in um, in, a, in two weeks or three weeks with something specific that answers your specific question, Mr. Langsdale. Those are our options. So um, the one option that I, that I think is, it solves all of our problems is to come back with something specific from, Mr. from the, the applicant in two weeks with the timer and, and the timing sense and we can deal and a uh, schedule and we can deal with it at that point, as opposed to trying to make these decisions and going on with this. If, if I Maxfield. may, am I allowed to say- Just anything? a second, Mr. Just, just a second, Mr. Auerbach, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, let's, let's, let's just do this so we can hopefully move on with this. Can I make a motion here? They're essentially the same thing, worded a little bit differently that we, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion. We advise staff to require a um, the the photo the whatever the, whatever the name of the timer is. There, I'm I'm going to go ahead and make that motion, and we'll we'll, we'll so go moving, and move on. To you're that. moving to amend the motion that yeah. this, we advise the staff to require to advise the staff to make a condition of the building permit the in, the use of a photovoltaic timer yes that's is there a second to mr maxfield's motion miss parks second second that second that motion all right the motion before the body is an amendment to the underlying motion to advise staff to acquire a, a photovoltaic timer as a condition of a building permit any discussion all those in favor uh this is a a um Roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. The vote is 5 0 on the amendment. Now we vote is on the underlying motion as amended to approve the de minimis change. This is a roll call vote. Is there any discussion? All those in all those in favor, uh, say aye. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Motion's 5-0, it carries. Um, the de minimis uh, change is approved by the board. And the with the with the advice to staff on a photovoltaic um, sensor. All right. Good luck, Mr. Arbach. Thank you very much to the board. We appreciate this positive vote, and um, you all stay safe. Now, the next item on the agenda is a public hearing on ZBA FY 2021-06. Backyards ADU requests a special permit to allow a supplemental detached dwelling unit as an accessory to a one family detached dwelling under section 5.0111 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaws located at 34 Baker Street, map 13D, parcel 46, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. This is continued from December, our meeting on December 10th, 2020. These, um, Sitting for this uh, matter is Mr. Greeny. He's there, there we go. Mr. Greeny is sitting for this matter. Um, 
what we have as a submission is um, a letter from an email from Mr. Lee with Backyards ADU asking for um, wishing to withdraw this without prejudice. That's all the information that we have. And no other submissions. Uh, this, so the effect of this is that, is that the applicant has withdrawn. They can resubmit at some point. Um, but we have to approve the withdrawal of that application before the board. Is there any discussion on that motion? If not, is there a, do I have a motion to um, permit the withdrawal of this application? So moved. Mr. Maxfield moves it. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Greeny seconds it. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, this requires a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Greeny? Aye. Motion is 5 0, unanimous. It carries. Um, motion is withdrawn. The application is withdrawn. Before we move on to the next item, I want to um, acknowledge that Ms. O'Meara, uh, Joan's going to be stepping off the ZBA. Um, I, we, Joan and I joined this on the same meeting about what was it, three years ago. Um, we've been partners in this for, uh, uh, for three years and she's got better things to do with her time, I understand. And um, not, not to demean what we do, but just, I think grandchildren are always better than anything you can do at the ZBA. And so I wanna congratulate you for that. And I wanna thank you for being a really great board member and being a friend on this board. And thank uh, you so much for all of your work. Uh, should I say I'll be back? <laughs> yes, I hope you will. I hope you will. <laughs> and I, I credit the board for all the hard work they do. And I know it's tedious and aggravating sometimes, but we're serving a community with really good, really good people. I wish you all the best, be safe. Thank you, Joan, for your work. It's been great work. Hey, Keith. Yep. yep. Thanks, Thank Joan. You, Joan. Thanks, Joan. It's been great working with you. Thank you. All right. Next order of business is um, a public hearing on, Z, on ZBA FY 2021-03, Pioneer Property Services, LLC. Request a special permit to convert the existing detached garage to a residential unit, which will increase the number of residential units, converted dwellings from one to two under section 3.3241, 9.22 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 275 East Pleasant Street, map 11B, parcel 63, neighborhood residents are in zoning district. This was continued from our January 28th, 2021 meeting. On this matter, um, Mr. Meadows, We'll be replacing Ms. O'Meara on the panel. Um, before we begin, I want to address two procedural issues brought up that were brought to the staff this week uh, concerning this application. A member of the public has raised asked the staff to turn on the video for all public commenters, uh, comment commentors. And in talking to the staff, I am informed that the town town boards only have board members, staff, applicants. Um, typically with the video on and that um, public commenters, the video is not on, but the audio is on. They come in as, uh, and they're, they're um, recognized as by the staff or by the chair and given an opportunity to speak, but their video isn't put on. That's for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, the, um, it's, it's time consuming. You have to make sure that the video is on when that person wants to speak. It, you have to make sure that Maureen would have to help people to try to do that many times. That becomes time consuming. Um, starting them as a panelist can be time consuming as well. The, sometimes a commenter has trouble starting it up the video. So it all takes time. Also, there's a limitation on the, the bandwidth that we have. And if we have a large meeting where we have 50 or so people and they all wanna be, we wanna avoid having to put we, each one of them in individually which takes time and we put them in all in the beginning, then they were taking a bandwidth problem. So it seems that um, it, this is something that takes more time. I think our 
It just adds to the length of our meetings. I think our meetings are long enough already and I don't see any great public benefit to doing this. Lastly, I don't know that we wanna start this. The, the town has set a, pro, has set a um, position on this, a process. I don't think we should be changing it without having um, a discussion with the town manager or the town council. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna go forward with, the, with it as, as it's been done in the past and not do this until we get different guidance from the town manager or the town council. Um, I just also wanna say that we do give, regardless of whether we see your face in the public, we give great consideration to public comments. We go out of our way to make sure that we have time for them. We listen to them, we write them down, we make sure that the, the applicant responds to it or we can respond to it or town staff can respond to it. So I think that this, this is not an indication of um, not caring about the public comments. It's just that we don't wanna change that policy now and we may not have the bandwidth to deal with it. A second person has asked that the applicant not be permitted to respond to the public comments. After the, um, after the public comments, we always have the applicant be able to respond, answer the questions, maybe to um, reflect the, the views or concerns or respond to the views or concerns of the, of the public. Um, I'm going to continue the, the process we have had. I'm not going to do that. And I want to make sure that people know that this is the, the process that has been brought forward through the entire ZBA. It, um, it, it works very well. We go back and forth. And I think it's important to allow the applicant to respond and for the board members to hear the response and not just have, somebody's going to be last. And in this case, it's the board members asking the questions before them is the applicant responding to the public comment. And then before that is the public comment. So I think the procedural changes are not necessary and I certainly wouldn't wanna do it for this, this application alone. So I know that the staff was, has been asked to, to, to bring these items up and asked to have them brought up to, in this meeting. I don't think at this time it makes any sense to uh, change our current policy. And without direction from the town, we can't change the, the Zoom policy. Lastly, um, we spent a lot of time at the last meeting talking about how we get our information out to us before these meetings and how we have sufficient time to consider it. And we decided that seven days would make, last meeting, we thought seven days made a ton of sense. It gave everybody a chance to review it and gave chance for Maureen to be able to get it to us so that we can review it before the time. The well, good news is everybody got, all the, the applicants got their um, information in and the town uh, commenters got their information in seven days ahead of time. The problem is there was a lot of comments and a lot of stuff and it wasn't able to, and it took a day or more to put it all together so it could be put into the um, project application report. That project, project application report was mailed on Monday and none of us, I don't think any of us received it ahead of the meeting. That project application report is I think the most important thing we have to deal with, particularly when we're dealing with a complicated application. It lays out the way in which we should um, review the, the findings, the waivers, if any, the con conditions that we have on, the, on the, uh, the special permit. And it's kind of the, gu the guidepost for all of us, the guide map for all of us. Um, we can get it online. It's not the same thing for me. I'm still a paper guy, even though I've gone through all this. I, I ended up printing up all of this paper myself um, just because it's easier for me to review it that way. So for tonight, I think that um, we've got, you've got the, um, the online version and we're gonna use that as best we can to try to guide our conversation. But I think it's very difficult to make this decision tonight when we don't have the paper in front of us. And I, would, I, I want everybody to know that there is no pressure to resolve this second, this application tonight before we adjourn, that if we feel that we need more time after hearing the applicant's new information after getting public comment and after our, our discussion, we can wait and do that next week. And I also think that we should probably be looking at something more than seven days for the submission of the material. That gives Maureen more time to put it together. That gives us more likelihood of getting it in advance and allowing us to look at it. So all that being said, we give it our best shot. We'll uh, move it back to 10 days and hopefully we'll be able to get that information to us um, before the, the meeting next, for the next meeting. All right, is there any questions on the process? Okay, good. Thank you all for your patience on that. Um,
So are there any disclosures? Submissions. Um, I'm going to go through the submissions that we've received. These are in the, um, the project application report. They're, they're available online in the OneDrive, but I will read them off here. Um, we received an app, the applicant's presentation from the January 28th meeting. We got an email from Mr. Sparkle dated February 2nd. We got a transmittal of supplemental information presented by Mr. Sparkle on that date as well. We got a uh, parking memorandum prepared by the engineer, Mr. Sparkle on February 2nd, a parking schematic of existing conditions prepared on by the same man on December on, on February 2nd. A gravel drive sensitivity analysis prepared by the engineer dated January 31st. Um, uh, the ZBA parking management plan for uh, dated February 2nd. A plan sent prepared by uh, Mr. Sparkle uh, with a title sheet and existing conditions, a site plan and details all dated uh, from February 2nd and February and January 24th. Email from Mr. Mendelson dated February 2nd, a memorandum from, from Pioneer Property Services dated February 2nd, management business overview on February 2nd. We received on February 2nd also a lease for 275A and 275B. Uh, um, yes, we received two, and we received a resident manager scope of services agreement and a property management plan also on February 2nd. Um, staff documentations, um, let's see, staff documents or project application report dated February 8th, a list of ZBA and town staff requests in preparation for the February 11th meeting, existing rental permit and associate parking plan, associated parking plan, comments from the town engineer dated February 3rd, and complaints filed with the town of Amherst for property as of February 4th, 2021. In terms of public comments, we've received 17 public comments since the last meeting. Those are from Mr. Stevens dated 28th, Mr. Rosnoy dated 29th, January 29th, Mr. Schreiber dated January 31st, Mr. Cobb dated February 1st, Mr. Carson dated February 3rd, Mr. Strayer February 3rd, Mr. LaRaja February 3rd, uh, an email attachment from Mr. LaRaja dated February 3rd, Mr. Schreiber February 3rd, Mr. Schreiber email dated the same day. Comments from Mr. Holton Cohn dated February 3rd. Ms. Kimberly Perez dated February 3rd. Comments from Taryn LaRaja dated February 3rd. Email from attorney Reedy dated February 3rd. Legal opinion via email from Mr. Reedy dated February 3rd. Comments from Ira Brick dated February 4th. Comments from Mr. Sherber dated February 6th. And an email attachment from Mr. Sherber dated February 6th. Oh, and Mr. Um, the, Mr. Chair, yep. and there was a email that came from Mr. Stryber on February 9th, which was emailed to the board. So that that's, was on Tuesday. That's right. I saw that. Thank you. Um, so that runs through the submissions and the uh, public comments that we've received. Um, all, as I said, all those were available to us on the OneDrive. Um, the current mo business before the board is the submission of the applicant answering the questions raised by the board at the last meeting, as well as responding to uh, um, issues raised by the public comments, uh, if they weren't able to, to um, respond to those at the last board meeting. So I'm assuming that if Mr. Sparkle is going to be speaking for the applicant I also want to acknowledge that Mr. Bard, the town um, counselor to the town, is on the um, is is on the call. In case we, so, if we have questions for the town uh, lawyer, the town attorney, um, Mr. Bard is here to answer those. All right, um, Mr. Sparkle, uh, how are you going to proceed? Oh, well, we'd also got. I guess that's right, Mr. Sparkle. We received your your uh, presentation today as well. Oh yeah, so, of course. Yep. Yeah. And the elevations. And elevations. Yep. yep. That was which unit. are available, which are available on, on the OneDrive, but. Um, Th those were submitted uh, this afternoon. Yep. Yep. Um, 
Good evening. Uh, it's good to see everyone again. Uh, for the record, I am Bucky Sparkle, the applicant's representative in this application. Um, I do have um, a much shorter slide presentation this time than last time, um, fortunately. Uh, but of course, there has been a lot of additional information submitted by uh, members of the public and their um, the attorney that they have brought in. So uh, I do have a little bit more to talk about and uh, I'm going to begin with a screen share. I have so many screens open. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, moving right right to uh, the requested information. So uh, we we received a I think an eleven point list or so of information that the board was interested in reviewing. Some of it was just updated information, some of it was, was supplemental and new information. Um, so it, since I, I understand that maybe not all of this documentation has been uh, reviewed in depth because of, of transit for the um, within the town system, um, I'm, I'm not planning on covering all of the details of, of that substantial stack of paper. So I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. And if there are questions, of course, um, be very happy to discuss. Um, the, one of the items uh, was, you know, copies of the, the leases as presented and clar clarification on that. So what, what I want to point out is um, it was asked how many tenants are going to be there. So unit A has six tenants, up to four of them can be unrelated. Unit A is the farmhouse. Unit B, the garage, can have uh, four tenants. The proposal is that they are all family, that they are not undergraduates, that we are requiring uh, an affidavit that the individual signs stating that they're not um, an undergraduate student or planning on being an undergraduate student for the duration of the lease. Um, and uh, these, are, these are restrictions that uh, honestly the applicant doesn't want, but we're trying to address concerns of the neighborhood. We, he's made several concessions um, during this process. Uh, so this is uh, our understanding to benefit the neighborhood to eliminate students, although some of the public comments are saying differently now. So we sort of have a mixed message and we might be talking about that a little more tonight. Um, there were questions about how many guests. So each unit can have four guests maximum uh, up to four consecutive nights maximum. Uh, on the property, it can have no more than 18 people um, between the two units anywhere on the property and um, no more than 10 people in the yard in the common areas outside of the buildings at any one time which is less than the current lease allows, which is 12. Um, there were questions about the drainage, seeking additional information relative to uh, the skim coat of grass over the gravel. How might that impact the hydrology? So I reran the model in a variety of different ways, provided some charts showing that there's, there's very little impact um, between all grass, half gravel, half grass, and gravel. Uh, that is in large part because hydrology considers the top five feet of soil. And this type of soil has a lot of runoff. So um, the, if it were all sand, you'd see something different, but it's, it is tight soils, re relatively tight. It's not clay, but it does have more runoff. So the way the numbers come out is there's, there's very little impact for the grass. Um, and uh, as I've stated before, that the proposed stormwater mitigation is, is independent of any of the impervious area. If this were a fully wooded site and they were gonna add four and a half thousand square feet for residents, uh, the proposal that I would make is, <clears throat> is really the same. Um, it, it's, it's more than adequate for a residential stormwater management system for all of the impervious area, whether or not there was gravel there or whether or not there was gravel there. Um, also, of course, the town engineer, Jason Skeels, has reviewed this report as well. And like the first time he reviewed the drainage analysis, it is adequate and it is accurate were his words. Um, so I'm confident that what I'm doing is, is working out and satisfies the town engineer. Uh, there was a question about lot coverage, um, trying to uh, balance the discrepancy between the surveyor's original plan and the modification of that plan that I submitted. Um, that the difference is, of course, the addition of the gravel driveway. We've shown evidence that it truly is there, photographic evidence from the sky and the ground. Um, and the, it's just not visible. It's, it's under an inch of grass. So the surveyors did not see it. 
Um, the board members, I don't think, saw it during their site visit, even though some members were standing on the gravel driveway. So it's just invisible under the grass. So the surveyors can't survey what they can't see. So that's, that's the discrepancy there. There were additional submittals requested um, in terms of you know, updating the management plan um, where uh, effectively uh, Pioneer Properties Services, PPS, uh, you know, their, their role is to you know, coordinate with tenants, with the community as necessary, with the Amherst Rental Office. Um, if there are any complaints, they go right to the property manager. Um, they are responsible for addressing all any all non-compliance issues, should there be any, for maintaining the grounds in all capacities, for handling the trash, snow removal, landscaping, all of that. And they will be regularly in contact with the resident manager. Uh, there was a request for a parking management plan um, that was submitted specifying that the each unit gets assigned spaces in the lot, so two for one unit, two for another unit. No parking is allowed on the grass. Um, that's a it's a town rule, but it's also written into uh, the leases, as is the statement that violating the um, that if you, if you're too many cars on site or they're not parked in their assigned parking spaces, that uh, they would be towed. Uh, there's no guest parking offered in this proposal, but on the weekends across the street there is a, a free lot available that UMass has. And there is also across the street, a bus stop for one of the three bus routes that goes by this property. Uh, there are also, for the other two routes, there's one stop a little bit north, one stop a little bit south. So there are uh, multiple ways for pedestrians or you know, walkers, bicyclists um, to, to get to this property as a guest, even uh, during business hours when you can't just drive across the street to UMass. There is a request for uh, an overview of Pioneer Property Services to give the board uh, an understanding of, of who they are and what they're doing. Um, this is a, a small family business. Uh, they live on Gray Street. They live four minutes away. I, I Googled it just to see. It's 1.0 miles. So they're, they're really quite local. Uh, they have been property managers for 10 years now. This is their third property. Uh, they have one in Belchertown, one in Northampton. So they're, I think, learning a little bit about how to, you know, be good stewards in Amherst as well. Uh, every municipality is going to have them doing different things. So they're, they're catching on here. Um, all facets of the business are managed by the families. So the uh, parents, Neil and Jen, handle quite a bit of it, but also the daughters, um, Ava and Leah, are involved in the business in terms of groundskeeping and some other uh, more rudimentary tasks. So it's a, it's a family business. And property management, just three properties, it's not a full-time um, income, right? So they, they do actual on-call 24-hour services for other landlords in the area. So they're, they are quite um, experienced in, in handling emergency situations or things that have gone wrong or stuff that has to be handled immediately. Uh, they do this professionally for other landlords. Um, so they're, they're not, um, even though they've done it 10 years for themselves, they, they do have a, a broad range of experiences under their belt. Um, and uh, they did acquire this property at 275 East Pleasant um, in August of 2019. So they've had it a year and a half. And since then, they have fully renovated the interior, cabinetry, electricals, plumbing, flooring, doors, they've done insulation. I mean, pretty much everything you can do inside of a house has been fully updated and nicely. It's quartz countertops, you know, hard hardwood flooring on the first floor. Uh, it's, they're not doing anything, um, you know, cheaply. This is, it's, it's well done. It's a fully furnished apartment as well. Uh, they have begun some of the exterior renovations so the amount of work that they've put into the property may not be extremely obvious um, at this point to the neighborhood, but we're hoping that it becomes a lot more obvious if this permit is successful. Um, there was a request for more information on the resident manager um, and um, a plan had been submitted for the previous meeting as well as for this one, they're very similar. The highlights are the individual has to have experience in property maintenance, at least the, the rudimentary functions, light bulb changing, plunging toilets, that kind of stuff. Um, have good communication skills, interpersonal skills, 
have favorable references references before they would be um, signed on for the job. Then they would be provided additional training on the details of the leases, on the property management plan specifically of conditions of a special permit, uh, as well as becoming very familiar with the Amherst tenant information sheet, which has uh, uh, quite a bit of good information on it, um, building systems, you know, you know, the breaker panel, et cetera. They would have responsibilities of being a point of contact between the tenants and the uh, property managers, the owners, PPS, um, for, for non-urgent issues. The tenants can, of course, contact uh, PPS directly if uh, they wish to, but there is somebody there who can handle basic things uh, and is given the authority to do so. Um, they are also there very specifically to report any non-compliance with um, anything, with the special permit or just the ordinances of the town. Uh, they are, it's a paid position, uh, even though it doesn't expect to have a lot of time required per month, it's still uh, $150 a month is now written into that agreement, uh, a number that's visible. And in the past, um, because there was quite a bit of concern that whoever the property or the resident manager was, was you know, just going to be chumming around and, and not doing their job, well, what kind of incentive is there? And um, in in an attempt to address that, we came up with a relatively draconian uh, perspective of, well, the, what incentive can we give them? Well, they're gonna get kicked out and they're at least terminated. But after thinking a little more about that and through the humanity of that situation, that's really not cool. So uh, what we've done is shifted to uh, a surety, some type of financial security if you were gonna you know, sort of a bond situation where they're, they earn their money every month and it goes into an escrow account. It is absolutely theirs entitled and they're entitled to it unless they fail to do, to do their job. If they fail in their responsibilities, then that uh, escrow account is vacated and is used in part in order that we can immediately acquire another resident manager um, and that those funds would be important in that transition. And while we won't kick them out, the lease would not be renewed. So they are aware that if they wish to remain at the property for an extended period of time, that that, that wouldn't be an option if, if they fail as a resident manager. Um, and <clears throat> finally, in terms of requested information uh, was some uh, plan changes, very minor. Uh, I'll bring them up here. Uh, they include, um, let's see. Uh, probably the biggest thing, I think this will work. Uh, the biggest thing is that at the front of the property where uh, the, the gravel and pavement is right now, so many cars have been parking there, the neighborhood clearly um, does not want that to occur. So we're proposing a vehicular barrier. I'll just read it comprised of boulders, woody vegetation, fence or other permanent feature, barrier shall not exceed three feet in height. We don't want to just put boulders there. They, they're not particularly attractive most of the time, uh, but we are, are interested in something that, that provides an aesthetic benefit. Uh, also would be a, a barrier for a vehicle uh, to not keep it from coming into that yard um, and also be low enough that is not a, a visual impediment because there, there are pedestrians. And if you're pulling out to an intersection, you need to be able to see over anything that um, would be near the roadside. So they're limited to three feet in height. The other plan change is the uh, doubling of the length of this purple line. This is the screening fence. Uh, there was consider concern that potentially, you know, despite the other vegetation there, that as a vehicle leaves this site, the headlights would come along and impact the abutter. Uh, so the, the fence length has been doubled and we're still totally open to working with the neighbor and placing that fence to their, their greatest advantage. Um, but it's now quite, quite a significant fence. Um, and, um, oh yes, there was another uh, change to the plan and that was this note because this is, this is an existing fence and um, you know, copper tops, nice lattice top, it's, it's a relatively attractive fence for being a screening fence because it's supposed to be a visual barrier. But as you can see in this one, it was pointed out, there are gaps in the planks. 
So uh, if we're going to use a style like this to prevent headlights from going through, uh, this is not good enough. So we've, we've established that the board shall butt together such that a solid screen is provided. Um, and that's the, that's the purpose of this uh, fence. So uh, it, it's important that it is uh, fully opaque to light. Um, and so that, uh, and as, as Maureen mentioned as well, and I, I don't have it up uh, easily, I can certainly bring it, but there were um, uh, changes made to the architectural drawings. There was a, a letter that came in from one of the abutters saying that um, essentially every, everything we've done is, is questionable because the architectural elevations um, did not reflect the, the plan accurately. And those, those elevations were the ones that were submitted um, at the onset of the project when it was a three bedroom dwelling in the proposed in the, in the garage uh, dwelling conversion. So when the floor plan changed to a two bedroom, which is the current proposal, the elevations were not updated. Uh, the applicant felt that it, it gave the board a really good sense of what it was going to look like uh, in terms of you know, the external aesthetic conversion. And since this is in the Historic District Commission or Design Review Board, um, you know, we thought that that was adequate to give the board a sense of what was going on. But um, since it came up <clears throat> in, in a comment, uh, those drawings were updated. So the windows do now reflect the placement uh, where the floor plan would show them to be. Mr. Sparkle, can you show, do you have that? I, yes, I, I or do. Maybe, um, I mean, I have a copy of it, but I don't know if the other board members have a copy of that. I, I am hoping they show up on your screen now. Is that, do you see the yeah. architectural drawing? Yep. Yes. Okay, so that is the west side. That is the side that is uh, between the two buildings. Uh, it's where the concrete porch is. Um, right now there's a door um, through, well, I guess this is on the other side, but there isn't a door here, but uh, this is, um, you know, the, the window into the living room now is demonstrated. And if we look at the front elevation, uh, the north side of the house, uh, originally um, there were two windows to the left of the door and one window on the right. But with the revised floor plan, the windows are in these locations. Um, all right. So if there are no further questions on the, the window locations, where am I? Um, there are, um, you know, we, ha we have received again uh, a fair amount of input from the public. And uh, while a lot of that I, I feel is a little bit redundant and keeps bringing up points that I've, I've debunked previously, uh, I, I don't want to go over all of that again. It's, it's a substantial amount of information. I, I do want to touch on things that um, are relatively new, or I think are, are, are really worth talking about in the public hearing. Um, so in terms of the public input, uh, what, what I want to talk about is um, a lot of people have said that the, the safety issue of vehicles backing out is a, is a fabricated safety issue, that we're just pretending it's there. Um, that is not the case. Uh, it is impossible to turn a vehicle around on this property, even just one single vehicle. Uh, I mean, motorcycle, you could turn a motorcycle around, but any car could not, um, could not execute a turn into the public right-of-way without driving over either the sidewalk or the grass and yard, which is not permitted. Um, I did verify this uh, with the zoning enforcement officer just to make sure you can't drive over the yard, you can't park on a yard. Um, and to uh, demonstrate this a little bit better, um, I had submitted this plan previously, and then today I had, gosh, an extra half an hour with my life. So what I did is I, I grabbed um, this um, swept path analysis software opportunity just to give people a sense. So I've overlaid, I've submitted this drawing earlier, but I've overlaid um, um, an SUV, a, a Ford Explorer. As, as a vehicle to demonstrate that if you were to back out of the garage, by the time you clear the garage and could execute the hardest possible turn that vehicle can make, you drive over the sidewalk and then you're still not even facing the street. Um, you could not turn right. And if you turned left, you would have a, a terribly 
uh, shallow angle across uh, oncoming traffic lane, which is a very unsafe uh, turning maneuver. And if you were to drive all the way down to the back of the gravel driveway and park nose in, which even in itself is maybe a little conservative, to get out of that space, at least half of the vehicle is going to have to drive over the grass. And, um, and there are larger vehicles out there. If this were a pickup truck, it would be almost completely off the grass and wouldn't even be able to make this turn. So they'd be all over the yard in order to get in and out. And it's not allowed. So the, the reality is the only way to exit this property in a car is in reverse um, or stop in the street and back into the property, which I think is illegal. So I'm not recommending that. Uh, so it is not a fabricated safety issue. It has never been a fabricated safety issue. The town engineer has said that safety is an issue on this property and that this site plan is going to improve that. I know that the fire prevention officer also talked about uh, emergency vehicle access and that the proposal would improve that for for the town services. So the, the people in the town who are really concerned and knowledgeable about safety are, are agreeing with our uh, analysis of the situation. Um, <clears throat> there was a comment made about the assessor data and how the overall condition of this property is, is only rated at 48%. Um, and as has been stated in multiple comments, the, it said 30 years of neglect this property. It's, it is not an asset to the neighborhood uh, in its current condition. Um, it was even suggested that properties uh, at this level should just be torn down. Um, but the 48% overall condition was the number prior to the Mendelssohn's and PPS taking on this project and commencing the renovations. So even at a partially complete renovation, the current assessor data is that the overall condition is now at 70%. So as you can see, the, the applicant really is working to make this uh, a better property. And you know the phase one has occurred and the exterior renovations to the farmhouse are you know, up and coming that number is going to keep going up. And of course, renovations to the garage are, are the heart of this application. Um, and uh, it had been mentioned uh, a few times that making, you know, if this permit were to be approved, that it would be a floodgate uh, to development, that um, all of a sudden developers would be coming in here and turning every scrap of land into other housing. Um, of course, these rules have been on the books since at least 1986. Um, and in that time, there has been one dwelling conversion in 35 years um, in the neighborhood. So in terms of, of the, the fears of what could happen, that has been possible for 35 years and it's happened just once in 1998. And um, that particular property, um, Tom Reedy talks about in his letter. So I'll, I'll get to that a little bit in responding to him. Um, we've also heard, um, I, I mentioned that the, we, we got the very strong impression that students were just not welcome as additional neighbors in this, in this neighborhood. Um, so uh, against my client's inclination, he said, well, I'm, I, know, I don't want them there either, honestly. And, and many, many landlords regularly say no undergraduate students. That's, that's a norm in the industry. Um, but to appease what we thought, to appease the neighborhood, we would request a condition be made saying, well, you know, if we don't want them and if, if it's necessary to make the public satisfied and it pleases the board, we're, we would put that as a condition. Um, and that raises a bunch of questions. And um, so I'll, I'll re reiterate, and I'd love to get the board's opinion um, at some point this evening of, of how, how members feel regarding excluding by a condition, even one that's been requested students from a town approved permit. Um, we have heard from the neighbors in a very eloquent um, letter that, uh, you know, I'll just say in my experience, not only do uh, the student renters at 265 East Pleasant Street not contribute to noise and environmental pollution. The multiple renters I have known over the past three years have been exemplary neighbors. And this is absolutely possible. The students are people and some people are awesome. Some people are not. 
on average undergraduates, you know, they're experimenting in life, but I was a very respectable undergraduate tenant off campus housing. And I know many other people are capable of doing that. Um, and the applicant is willing- well, Mr. Sparkle, I'm, I would be really, you know, we maybe can give you that, but I think what's helpful for us right now is, is your, what you're proposing in terms of students. Okay. And, um, and that would be the, I think that's what we need to hear. All right, well, the, the, we're gonna leave the, the proposal as it was at the last meeting, which is we would request a condition to exclude undergraduate students. And if that warrants more discussion, we're open to it. Got it. Thank you for the okay. clarification, Mr. Judge. Um, and then, <clears throat> oh yeah, that um, I, I skipped over that Amherst housing market study uh, that was brought up by um, an abutter, well, not an abutter, but a member of the public. And um, I, I don't quite understand the, the point that was trying to be made with that, because if, if you're at all familiar with this document, which I, I wasn't, so it was nice to get into it. Um, it basically reads like 125 pages of saying that this application is, is really important to the town. Um, that if you just skim through, when I, I read in detail the executive summary, um, and it talks about, you know, currently in Amherst, uh, that the current zoning density restrictions block lower income renters and owners that um, housing needs, the, the, the housing itself needs to be smaller for non-student households and single people, which is lacking in the town, um, that there's an unmet demand for 150 to 250 houses per year, and that substantial new construction is uh, required, is what the report says, and it recommends um, things, changes like multifamily by right, removing special permit requirements for those, creating two and three bedroom cottage style units at higher density, um, and amending bylaw 3.32, which is what we're talking about here, uh, to allow infill dwelling units and adaptive reuse dwelling units in the RN district specifically. Um, so the, this proposal lines up completely with the, the needs of the town and the recommendations of this Amherst housing market study, as well as other zoning priorities that are being changed. So I, I thought it was important to bring that to you know, the board's attention, which you're probably aware, but also to the public's attention. Um, and uh, let's see, <clears throat> Mr. Reedy's letter. Um, it was only four pages this time. So uh, I don't I don't need to take up nearly as much time uh, in, in, in covering it here. He, he makes um, three main points and makes a few other statements. So one of his main points is that the use as a garage is different than the use as a dwelling. I completely agree. And I know that the nature of a dwelling conversion is, is to change the use from a place that humans aren't occupying to a place that humans are occupying. Um, so I'm not sure the, the impact of, of his point there. Um, he also talks about the effect on uh, the neighborhood and incorrectly asserts that the safety issue is, is made up, which it has not been. The town agents have shown that. I've, I've shown that with turn analysis and, and other means, uh, the cars have to back out. It is an unsafe condition. Uh, Mr. Reedy incorrectly asserts that traffic, noise, and refuse will double. Um, there are no new cars being allowed on the property. You can have four now, and there are often four. You can have four in the future. So there's no new cars, so we're not doubling the traffic. Um, instead of having 12 people outside able to make noise, only 10 people are outside able to make noise, so we are not doubling the noise. Um, and I, I agree that the, the amount of trash is likely to increase by nearly double, uh, but the number of waste bins do, does not increase, so it is still uh, no impact on the neighborhood in that regard. Uh, the third point Mr. Reedy makes <clears throat> is that this is um, absolutely positively a detriment to the neighborhood, um, where he also incorrectly states that additional cars on the property as a detriment. Well, that's not the case. He, again, um, reiterates the, the incorrect belief that traffic noise and refuse are doubling. That's, that is not happening. Um, and um, he, he ignores entirely in his statements that there, there are legitimate legacy detriments embedded in this property now in terms of the safety issue, which I've talked about a lot, in terms of drainage that the neighbors have cleaned about, 
claimed about flooding basements, including a light nuisance, where light is broadcast in all directions from this building. Um, and the parking and aesthetics are, are very dissatisfactory to members of the community. All of those detriments are, are conveniently ignored when he talks about detriment. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that they, they came back into the conversation. He also, um, he, he incorrectly states that an entirely new driveway will be created around the building. Of course, there is an existing driveway. Um, he incorrectly states that the board does not have enough information. And of course, you, you get to tell me if this is true, but uh, he says that you haven't been given information on stormwater, on traffic, or on lighting. Um, I've made two submittals on drainage. Um, the town engineer has reviewed them twice and approved them. I think that's a fair amount of information, particularly for a residential project. Uh, in terms of, of traffic, we're, we're not increasing the number of cars. We've made that clear. We've shown you know, turning motions and that we can make a much safer condition. Uh, the town engineer also believes that to be the case. Um, we've provided information on lighting, indicating that we will be uh, following the requirements for downcast night, uh, dark sky compliant lighting. Uh, so, so we really have pr provided the very things that Tom says we have not. Um, and um, then Mr. Reedy goes and talks a bit about 319 East Pleasant Street, um, where he, he, he gets it wrong saying that the project was not a dwelling conversion. It was absolutely a dwelling conversion. The decision only cites one bylaw section, 3.324 converted dwellings. Um, so that's, that's the that's the only thing in that permit uh, relative to the bylaw. Um, Mr. Reedy also states that that permit was approved because it was owner occupied, but there was a whole list of reasons why this project was approved, um, all, uh, all of which are quite applicable to what we were doing. And the owner occupancy per the bylaw is one of the safeguards available uh, to make sure that somebody's keeping an eye on things and a resident manager is the other safeguard available. So in this case, it is not- So Mr. Sparkle, we're at, th we're at 32 minutes right now. Um, can you get your, yeah. um, get, get your major points here and, and let's, um, well, let's I'll, give them- Yeah, I, I will yep. jump down to this last line here. <clears throat> um, um, just deal with the, the, the new issues that uh, were brought up in Mr. Reedy's letter, not the ones that we dealt with last week or okay. two weeks ago. Thank okay. you. Um, you know, I guess the, the summary of Mr. Reedy's letter um, that, that uh, I'm getting out of it is that he's stating that um, if you want to do a dwelling conversion within the footprint of an existing house, that's fine. That's an asset to the neighborhood. But if you want to do a dwelling conversion within the footprint of an existing garage, that is going to destroy the neighborhood. Um, and, and that's an argument. That's, that's his best argument that I can find in that letter. Um, and I'm personally, I, I'm not buying that. I don't know that uh, okay. attach or detach would affect the neighborhood uh, detrimentally, especially not so severely. Um, <clears throat> so this, this will bring me then to my, my last slide here um, about you know, what, what really happens here. And we're, we're not planning for failure and uh, we don't want the, the board to um, you know, you know, look at this as the worst case scenario. At the same time, a lot of what is being decided here is, is what is the long-term impact on the community, on the neighborhood, uh, if, if this were approved. And we're, we're trying to use our crystal balls and, and provide all this background information. Um, so I am you know, going to take a look at you know, if, if this went as bad as it possibly could be, if every fear that the neighborhood brought up came to pass, a special permit were revoked. Um, the impact on the community is, um, not even a detriment in that case. We're not cutting down a whole bunch of trees and putting up a parking lot. Permanent improvements for the neighborhood is that pedestrian and traffic vehicular safety are going to be improved with the ability to turn around on site now in perpetuity, whether or not that garage is a residence or not. That the stormwater runoff is going to be reduced now and in perpetuity. Uh, that the parking and the pavement are being removed from the front yard that the 30 years of neglect have, will have been renovated. Uh, we are putting more than 30 plants on the property, uh, including replacing the one tree that is being cut down. Uh, a 64 foot privacy fence will be installed. All the lights are gonna be downcast. That, that's the impact 
to the neighborhood um, in the worst case scenario here. Um, of course, the owner, Pioneer Property Services, would lose their investment and uh, a revenue stream. So really the, the, the risk of anyone is on Pioneer Property Services and this you know, kind of run down unsafe house on the corner will get a major overhaul in almost every way that you can evaluate a piece of property. Um, and that does conclude my 32 minutes and change. Um, thank you for letting me go on and I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna leave it here. If we have any questions regarding the plan, I'll go back and release the screen share if we just wanna talk. Thank you, Mr. Sparkle. Um, what I'd like to do is give the board an opportunity to respond to, to question any um, thing that, that's new in your presentation, and then we'll go to public comment. Um, so do members of the board have questions for Mr. Sparkle or for the applicant? Mr. Langsdale. Excuse me. Um, I just had a, a few and I'll just name them off and you can talk about them then. Uh, the last I saw, of the lease, the lease uh, was for seven months. Has that been changed and will it be changed? The, is there any consideration to any sort of a small bike rack somewhere on the property? Um, the vehicle barriers and the screening fence, <clears throat> um, I think before we're going to be able to vote on this, we would need images of what you propose rather than just telling us. Um, and the other thing, this keeps coming up. It, it comes up in, uh, in your presentation tonight, but it's come up in uh, comments from uh, uh, neighborhood people about uh, 275A. Um, when we did our site visit, uh, we did not go into 275A. Um, I think it's imperative for us to really have an idea of what in fact has been done and what is to be, what is, what are they proposing to do? And if a site visit 275A is not in the cards, let's say, uh, desirable, can we get pictures, images of the, uh, renovations inside that building so that we have a sense of what's been done and uh, what their intentions are. Those are my questions. Yes, um, happy to address them. So the, the seven month lease uh, is because um, when, when the current tenant came on board, the um, they were friends of the family and they had a student who was having sort of a, a housing crisis due to COVID and, you know, asked the Mendelssohn's if they would consider letting the student occupy the farmhouse, um, which nor is not normally the, the plan here, um, but they know them and they established at that time a seventh month lease because that was the semester term from the time they moved in till the end of the semester. Um, that lease has been extended and does expire this summer. I, I'm not sure the date, um, but it, it's after the semester ends um, because they turned out to be great tenants. Um, they, they weren't gonna renew the lease if they weren't good tenants. That's why it only had a seven month term. And you, I have noticed, um, actually today it was, I think, that the proposed lease for 275B also has a seven month clause, but you'll see also that those dates are 2020 dates. It's, it's the exact, there's a copy and paste of the 275A lease versus the B lease because they are very, very similar documents. So that, that was an oversight, but that it, the reason it's seven months is it was just for an academic session. Okay, and how, how many people are in 275A right now? I believe there are four. So, so there are more people than just this one student who his parents asked if he could stay there. Yes, there are, um, and I believe they are all. I believe they are all students. Um, is is my understanding? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, they are, they're all friends, I guess, is what I'm hearing from the client. And they oh, okay. are, yes, students. Um, in terms of the bike rack, um, absolutely no problem. Uh, that we'd be very happy to add that um, at a, a safe and convenient location, probably behind the proposed dwelling, um, maybe under the deck or somewhere back there. So they're out of sight from the public way. Uh, happily provide that um, and we would have no problem providing um, you know sketches or further information about the vehicle barrier um, and, and we have uh, I guess we have options on that so I'll have to talk to the Mendelssohn's because obviously I can't provide that tonight right okay and the last question was in improvements made to 275a um, it is in the public record <clears throat> I will indicate at first that uh, a whole bunch of plumbing and electrical renovation insulation permits have been pulled for this property since August of 2019. So there, there is a public record of all the permits. Now, of course, you can pull a permit and not do the work, mm -hmm. um, but there are a, a whole bunch of improvements. I have a, a, this is a partial list of improvements that have been made. Um, it, so there was uh, vegetative growth higher than the garage and all over the building. The, all the vegetation and brush has been cleaned up. A new boiler, water heater, electrical service, rewiring kitchen and bath, um, con converting some interior rooms. Uh, new windows were appropriate. P pine boards on the first floor, new flooring upstairs, uh, solid pine interior. So Mr. Sparkle, will you submit that for the record? Oh, so I'm I, yep. ha happy to do so. That would be great. Yes, and um, I, I have seen uh, a couple of, couple of pictures of sort of the renovation in, in progress, but since these were done and then it has been you know, occupied, there, there aren't a lot of uh, showcase pictures um, uh, to, to offer today. Um, so since we so, will need to come back with the- So will you ask, just to speed this up, you will ask, will you ask the, the, um, the owners if they would be willing to Submit some photos. Absolutely. If I'm not, I mean, then we'll deal with this. Ms. Ms. Pollock? Uh, I wanted to uh, just point out to the board um, that, and to Bucky, that uh, Mr. Mendelson actually did submit photos uh, oh. in, of the interior space to uh, the existing dwelling unit. Uh, I do have them up um, if, if board members want to sort of skim through them. Or, or I can certainly re-email them to you. Um, it's so he submitted them way back when in October. So perhaps uh, memory is uh, lapsing on, on, on everyone's part because that was a while ago. Uh, would you like to see them? Uh, would you like to see them or? Mr. Langsdale, do you want to see those or do you want to observe them later? Uh, uh, later is yeah, fine. See them. Okay. Later is fine. Yeah, right. I'd like so to let's make sure that we let's make sure you distribute those to the board members then, Maureen. That'd be great. Sure. Send us uh, all files of those. Thank you. Good. Um, great. Did that? Uh, I think those were question? the points that I noted, Mr. Langsdale. Is there anything else? Yep. Uh, you no, know, that was it. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Um, do you have a list of the work that will be done to Unit A that is not done? like the exterior painting job. And then there was like, um, it seems like some of the window sills are uh, corroded or. Um, yeah, the, the, there has only been partial improvements completed on that. So my, my understanding is that the, the roof is going to be renovated and the rest of the exterior is going to be cleaned up. There's still repairs to do on siding and the details around windows. Uh, and then eventually painting after all of that is cocked and sealed. Um, there was also you know, part of the insulation installation, installation process um, uh, re required some clapboards to be removed. So they're actually, the building received a, a small amount of damage to, to do the updates and not all of that has been cleaned up yet. Um, but they're, they're looking to, you know, really, you know, cl clean up these buildings quite, quite a bit and they, on the inside from you know, the pictures that I've seen and the, the list that I've, I've read before, um, it, it has not been shoddy work. You know, solid wood 
six panel doors they're you know you, you can buy a cheap door for sure and that's not one of them uh quartz countertops etc so they're they're not doing this on on the cheap um they're, they are making it nice and that's been their intention prior to applying to the special for a special permit so is there a timeline for when that work will be completed to the exterior of that building um, my expectation is it would be concurrent with the renovation to the garage at this point, and I believe they are ready to proceed with that this building season. Okay. So, Ms. Parks, can I just interrupt for just a second? So, Mr. Sparkle, um, is there a list? I know you gave us some there. Is there a list that the homeowner would be willing to commit to in a condition or in other, or, did, or at least, you know, commit to the board? Yes, we, okay. um, I, I, I can get you a list again, since, since I have to make at least one submittal, um, I am hearing mm -hmm. from Mr. Mendelson that um, he'll, he'll get a list to you and they, implant, right. they plan to commence in the spring. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that Ms. Parks, go ahead. That's all, I, I just, I, I went by today and I, I didn't realize that the exterior was not completed of unit A. And so uh, I was just concerned about if unit A is gonna be completed uh, before unit B is started or... Um, I, I'm pretty sure that the, the momentum that got them to this state, they have, they've done 90%, you 95% know, of the renovations to A and they, are just going to wrap it up when the building season comes back. Um, the, the two projects are, you know, they're related being the same property. If we're going to be doing roofs, you're going to do two roofs at the same time. Um, you know, painting exterior work, it's nice to do them you know, together when you have that crew and talent there. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to get to, um, so yes, those improvements I'm, I'm certain are going to be completed um, because they started them and nearly completed them before the special permit was applied for. It's, it's the plan. Okay. Mr. Sparkle, can you run through the, or are you done, Ms. Parks? So that was, yep. So um, will you run through the, the least restrictions in terms of who's going to be tenants in unit A and unit B? In unit A, you have four people that are allowed, four tenants that are allowed. What's the relationship between the tenants? It, well, unit A is the farmhouse, and that yep. does allow up to six people. Four of them can be six unrelated. People. No, there's four unrelated. Four unrelated. Um, if they are related. So that means, in, in effect, you could have a couple in, or, or two related people in one of the three bedrooms, and then two unrelated people in each of the other two, two bedrooms. Is that correct? That is technically possible, yes. Okay. All right. And what's B? Um, actually, I'm going to take a step back on that because if you have four unrelated people and a couple, if they don't know each other, then there are five unrelated people in that, that situation. So um, by nature, you could not have that density of four unrelated and then two other people, even though they are related, because everybody's related to somebody. But we're talking about relative to the household. So it could be um, it would have to be ideally a family situation if you were going to have six people in there. But that's, okay. no, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time following that. And it may be that I'm not as familiar with uh, rental policy, but you, you, have a, you have two people who are related to each other, a couple, mm -hmm. for lack of a um, less precise term, and four other individuals who um, they're rented on a they, on an individual basis by the uh, or they they know each other and they rent out those additional be bedrooms. Why is that not well, it, two people? Not six total people, four unrelated and two related. Um, Why is that? Because I think within the house within the household, if you look at the couple and the four other people you've got four unrelated and two more people that are unrelated here. So you've got at least five unrelated people in that circumstance, even though they're a couple. So if you were going to get oh. so many people in, um, and if you look at the bylaw definition 1217 of a family or household, 
you, you can have a bunch of unrelated people, but it stops at four. Um, and if you're, the occupancy mm -hmm. could be six for this dwelling, but they would just have to be related. And what you might end up with is four related people and two unrelated people. And then you would still be within the term uh, of the lease as well as the definition of a household within the town. So Mr. Mora, can, maybe you can help me with this. Um, and maybe me. Yeah, because I'm having a hard time understanding how this all works. And I think, I, I think it's an important ask, and we haven't even got to the new structure yet. So I think this can, can you help on this or Mr. Bard, either one, who, who would like to take a run at explaining this for my benefit? Well, yeah, there's, I mean, a lot of different scenarios with tenants um, and arrangements that could occur, but, uh, you know, just as a reminder, the bylaws allow for uh, up to three lodgers and boarders in a dwelling unit by right. So that, that is something that a family, a couple, whatever the scenario is uh, that holds the lease to the unit uh, is able to have as lodgers and boarders under our bylaws, so unless the permit conditions that otherwise that's, that's one situation. Other than that, we've, we've seen all kinds of um, attempts to get additional occupants into a unit. Um, it's, it's four people. If the four people are not related, then you know anything more than four is uh, exceeding four unrelated in our view. And that's the way we've consistently applied that. So um, you know, six sets of siblings you know, exceed four unrelated. You know, so it's that number four that we've, uh, you know, that we've uh, enforced in the situations that we've been involved in uh, very consistently. Ms. Parks. So uh, when you say related, do you mean a couple with children or um, if, if a boyfriend and a girlfriend, are they related? Um, we would defer to... Um, Definition 1217 in the bylaw, uh, which allows a, a variety of household configurations and is a fairly inclusive definition. Uh, we don't want to be in the business of defining families. So, but uh, so in, so could you have three couples living in this house? Not if they're not related. You could have three, maybe three brothers who married three sisters, if we want to get really interesting, um, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, that, now the math is getting to be confusing for me. So uh, just for everyone's benefit, yeah, okay. um, I have pulled up uh, section 12.17 in the uh, zoning bylaw, which uh, defines uh, family, household, um, and the different sort of varieties. So the first one is an individual residing in one dwelling unit or a group of persons related by marriage, civil union, blood, adoption, uh, guardianship, or other duly authorized consul con uh, con uh, custodial relationship residing together in one dwelling unit or a group of unrelated individuals not to exceed four uh, residing properly in one dwelling unit. In this instance, accessory use as described in uh, section uh, 5.010 and 5.011 is not permitted. And then the last one is a group of individuals. Um, this is not applicable here, but I'll, I'll read it. No. A group of individuals, regardless of relation, residing in a congregate congregate or similar group housing for the elderly or disabled in a in halfway houses or in other group residential uses authorized and operated under state and federal law. Okay. So, yes. so um, could a, so is there a limit? So in unit A, if there was a married couple with 10 children, could they live there? Or is six the maximum number of people that can live there? Six is the maximum. Okay. And in unit B, four is the maximum? Correct. It, you know, it, is that right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's right. In, 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 in unit A, if you have a, if you have a, a married a couple with six kids, aren't they a family? 
And wouldn't they be allowed in unit A? With three bedrooms? Um, Mr. Barr or Mr. Uh, Mr. Mora, Mr. Barr, either one. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if there's a family, you know, there there isn't necessarily a limit on the the number okay. of people that are going to live in that unit. However, um, there are code requirements, minimum sizes of the unit mm -hmm. that makes it safe for the number of people. That that comes into play. It's not a zoning matter at that yeah. point. Um, you know, the the uh, landlord might be saying based on the size of this unit they feel like it's appropriate for up to six people. And that's something they have to manage mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and work out with a, with a uh, tenant. But we're not, we're not limiting the number of family members that are uh, children to you know, a, a couple uh, in, in a dwelling unit, and unless we find it to be an unsafe situation that we have to respond to it for those reasons. Got it. Right. Mr. Attorney Bard. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So I, I just wanted to second that and just repeat the part of the definition that's relevant. So the definition of family, parentheses, household, uh, the, the second item is a group of persons related by marriage, civil union, blood, adoption, guardianship, or any other duly authorized, sorry, authorized custodial relationship residing together in one dwelling unit. And I'll just point out that there's no numerical limit on that, just uh, seconding what Rob Mora just said. Now, if the property owner wants to place a limit, that's a different story. But from the point of view of the zoning bylaw and the definition, there is no limit. And so if we have a, if, if the property owner wants to say that there's, a, you only will permit families in unit B, 275B, the new the converted, how is that how is that enforced by the town? If number one, can we do that? Can the can the owner, um, not we, but can the owner say I only want to rent out to uh, families as per the definition in the in the zoning bylaw? Um, and then how do we, if that's a condition that we I, I don't know if we, can we even compose that condition number one. Uh, and if we don't impose that condition, how do we ascertain and certify that that's indeed the case, if that is important to the um, the board for making its uh, decision on the application? Right. So uh, I believe we may have touched on this last time. So right. the, the question that's posed here is, can you impose it when it's requested by the property owner? In my opinion, you can. Um, it's, I guess, another question we don't, I'm going to duck today just as a court would, that we don't have the question before us as to whether the board can impose it on their own. And that mm -hmm. would be something we'd want to do some research on. But if you're asked yeah. by a property owner to impose that condition, you certainly can. How you enforce it, again, I'll, I'll defer to Rob Mora, but obviously it becomes tricky. It begins like any other zoning enforcement matter by somebody complaining to the zoning enforcement officer and then investigating, it would at that point be a special permit condition. So it is enforceable like any other special permit condition. And I'll say that, and there's lots of case law on this, that after the 20 day appeal period has passed with no appeal, it's presumed to be a valid condition and generally the courts have held beyond challenge. So then it's simply, an enforcement question. I'm sure it's the kind of enforcement issue that the zoning enforcement officers would not enjoy enforcing, but if it's brought to their intention, they investigate. And the first thing I assume they do is contact the property owner and say, we understand that the group of six people living in unit B are not a family and we want you to get back to us on that. Or, you know, however, mm -hmm. however their office handles that. Mr. Moore, do you have anything else to add to that? I mean, that, we did discuss this last week, and right. I mean, just to add, why you know we we aren't um, on our own initiative looking for Attorney Bard to do the research on that because we're not really interested in imposing those types of conditions because they are very difficult to enforce. And even when yeah. the violation or suspected violation is found, you know, we know that um, you know it's not going to be immediately resolved. 
in any case. You know, the residents, the, the occupants of that unit are not all of a sudden just going to pack up and leave because we asked them to. So, you know, we try not to create a situation that, uh, you know, will result in uh, the need for a long-term enforcement or um, a, a period of time that's needed for the, even the landlord to bring the property into compliance, which is why I think staff did ask the applicant to really have the a property manager prepared to provide the board with this information on how they're going to apply this type of condition, enforce it, because I think the most important thing to understand is how are they going to handle this and, and not so much how we're going to handle it. And I haven't heard that yet, so I wonder if that's going to come up at some point, but I think that's really important if we were going to seriously consider that as a meaningful condition imposed on their part uh, to support the, the issuance of this permit. So, yeah, that's when we have, that's what, one of the things we talked about two weeks ago. You mentioned that. Yep. Um, so, before we perform its parks, Mr. Sparkle, we'll need to have the applicant tell us how that's going to, how they would intend to um, enforce this and how they would certify it, ascertain the status, and then how they would let the town know that um, it's being complied with. Sure. Right. Well, I, I know a portion of that is in the lease agreement. Um, there well, is. But I think you should, I, I, it's, it's not there enough for us to evaluate it today. I think some, something from, the, from you or from the client, your client telling us how they intended to do that would be helpful. We okay. can provide uh, more detail thank on you. that. Yep, thank you. Ms. Parks. I'm just wondering what, what is the minimum uh, number of square feet per person in a dwelling unit? What is that, do we know? I don't. I'm sure that Mr. Moore knows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there. You know, it's not. It's not that simple as per person. There are minimum square footages for the various uh, parts of the dwelling unit. Uh, you know, kitchen has to be so big. A, be a bedroom has to be so big. And then the sanitary code will say how many square feet are needed per additional occupant in a in a sleeping room. Just you know, roughly, you're talking about 80 to 60 square foot feet in a bedroom for an occupant, but you know, when we when we try to, to work backwards to create um, the minimum square footage for say a tiny home, you know, it gets down to be about a couple hundred square feet or so, uh, and then it incrementally moves up by about 60 to 80 square feet per person. So it's relatively small. Uh, so smaller than the, the square footage we're talking about here for the num for four occupants. Okay. Um, Where do you find those numbers? Uh, part of them, part of the numbers are in the uh, state building code and part are in the state sanitary code. Okay. Other questions from board members? Last week I asked, Mr. Sparkle, I asked you about the um, the stormwater runoff and you provided additional information and it looks like the town engineer has, Mr. Skeels has also reviewed this and found it found your plan adequate for the I think that's what he's what the um, determination from the town engineer was um, I have to say that I'm not the expert those both those people are um, you and the town engineer have more expertise in this than I do but I'm I'm still um, su surprised that the proposed driveway um, and the discharge volume on the proposed driveway is less than the discharge volume on gravel is less than the discharge and uh, impervious I mean where you have an impervious surface is less than where you have a gravel surface a hybrid gravel surface and it is, is more than um, no gravel, which is just grass. Well, but, it's, it, is only know, less, is... it is only less when you account for the rain garden stormwater management system. If that were not- That's there, off the property. That's off the property is what you're saying then. 
Yeah, yeah that's they, the water that leaves the 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 lot. Yes. Okay. So it's it's not just a measure of the impervious area. The calculations account for all of the landscaping, um, the the rain garden. I calculated the area of okay. the retaining walls. So that's just not the flow over that surface. It's the flow up. It's what fills up the rain garden and then overflows from there. Yes, it Correct. is the discharge from the rain right. garden. And the uh, town engineer has is satisfied with the with the um, the design on this. I understand from his memo to the board. Yeah, or memo to back to, to Maureen. Correct. Um, Mr. Right. Chair, um, yes. Before we move on to the next topic, I, I um, unless I miss unless I uh, miss, uh, didn't hear it, um, you, uh, if you want to discuss about, you know, tenants per unit, I, um, I don't know if the board reviewed how many tenants uh, would be allowed in the, the proposed converted dwelling. And, we didn't. Good catch. and whether it'd be related or unrelated or students or not students. Thank you. Shall I proceed? Yes, please. Um, the, the proposal is for unit B to have uh, a maximum occupancy of four tenants and that they uh, will not be students is, is really what we're looking for in this, in this scenario um, because we are currently under the impression that that is important to both the neighborhood and the board. And would they be related or unrelated? Um, Mr. Mendelssohn has, has said unrelated, so I'm, I'm going to, to, to work with that. I have my own feeling that that might be more restrictive than necessary because it was the student issue um, yeah. that was most poignant, but he, he has indicated- You said unrelated or related, Mr. Sparkle, they, unrelated they, or- I'm, that the, the four people should be related. Related, okay. Not students. Not student, but related. So fa family, like uh, blood family, that that, and and so, uh, did you, so, um, you know, to piggyback the earlier conversation, of what Attorney Joel Bard and and Rob Moore had talked about, is, um, you know, can the board place a limit on related tenants, and then there was this discussion if if you can pose a condition that the applicant is requesting. Just uh, keep that in mind. Okay. Other questions from board members for the applicant? Okay. Um, I would then, we should then turn to public comment. I noticed that we have um, 20, we have 12 people uh, online um, listening. I'm cer certain that many of them want to comment. Um, I'd ask people who are, um, who want to comment to as best they can keep their comments to the new information. If you've already uh, expressed your concerns, we've heard them, uh, we've made note of them. We, um, I wouldn't, prefer not to repeat them. I think there's enough to discuss in the newly, um, new, new information that we've received tonight or uh, since last meeting. Um, so those, uh, please keep your comments to that if you can um, and keep them, try to keep them to three to four minutes um, and we'll try to move through it as quickly as we can, but we wanna give everybody an opportunity to speak. So with that, um, I would um, ask Maureen to start recognizing for public comments. Um, first, we have uh, Richard Ronzoy. Uh, I believe. Hi, Richard. Mr. Mr. Rosnoy. Yes, it's Rosnoy. Uh, Richard Rosnoy from 11 Strong Street in Amherst. <laughs> I'd like to um, talk about the um, the role of the board in terms of evaluating the facts of Mr. Sparkle's presentations. Uh, in particular, um, I'm, I'm happy to be first because um, uh, there were just some recent comments from, uh, from you, Chairman, Mr. Judge, about, about uh, the issue I'm gonna talk about. 
Um, Mr. Sparkle sent his uh, revisions to Maureen on uh, last, I think it was Tuesday evening. Maureen sent uh, an email to town engineer, Mr. Skeels on Wednesday at 1226. I think you have a copy of that email. It's a part of the record. Uh, the email was, was quite detailed from Maureen. Uh, Maureen asked Mr. Skeels to review in five particular areas, um, some of the factual details and technical information um, of the application. Number one was the so-called gravel drive and its safety. Number two regarded stormwater storm water and the impact of grass absorption uh, if there is grass covering the gravel driveway. Number three uh, involved the updated, updated fence plan. Number four was a parking management plan. And number five was a statement regarding the grass covering gravel driveway in terms of the discrepancy between the surveyor's plan that was submitted and the planning department's own plan, plan of the site. Um, the, these are important, these are key technical issues affecting this application. The board, as you just commented, Mr. Judge, uh, the board relies on the professional judgment of town staff to evaluate technical data. Um, and the applicant uh, is saying that, uh, yes, Mr. Skeels uh, evaluated all five of these detailed requests uh, which granted, it seems to me, I mean, I've been involved with a number of site plan reviews and it seems to me they involved a lot of information. And Mr. Skeels returned his memo, his email to Maureen at 1.16, the same day, 50 minutes later, saying his basic two, sen two sentences, I have reviewed the additional supplemental information and revised plans and have no additional comments. The applicant's responses appear to be adequate and accurate. Thanks, Jason. 50 minutes to review these five detailed, significant questions that affect this site. This board has a duty to evaluate the facts of this case. It's your discretion that the town relies on in evaluating the facts of the case. The veracity of the applicant saying that, oh yes, Mr. Skeels said it was okay. If the board accepts this, uh, there are serious problems with this. I encourage you to take a hard look at the presentations being made by the applicant in terms of their veracity, in terms of their consistency, and in terms of how they have shifted from the beginning of these hearings to whatever it is that you want, they will do. So my comment is regarding your evaluation on a factual basis of all these materials. And when you do that, I am quite convinced that you will find some significant issues that make it impossible to approve this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rosnoy. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so next we have uh, Mr. LaRoya. Hi, Ray. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not gonna repeat in detail all the issues. <laughs> You could just give us your name for the record again. And I'm address. sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. My name is Ray LaRaja. I'm in a butter to this uh, mm -hmm. project. Um, so I won't repeat it um, but about the harm, but uh, in a letter submitted I last, last week, I mentioned many falsehoods, uh, including assertions about the harm to the neighborhood. Um, we think insincere promises about renting to families, whatever that term may be. Uh, claims about a housing crisis and a major parking lot being necessary and a rainwater garden that's going to solve problems. So, uh, you know, I want to point out my neighbors raised additional issues showing clearly how this project is totally like 
unlike owner occupied rentals in the neighborhood, none of which uses a garage, especially one that fronts the street like this. They explained the enforcement and the ethical challenges which were brought up today about renting to a hard to find, hard to define family. The dangers of traffic, putting all these people on this property, especially to Wildwood families, a displayed lack of trustworthiness of the applicant as a landlord up to this point, the scale of the project relative to the size of the property, and the risky precedent to the town of allowing garage conversion. So we've offered compromises uh, in our suggestions to enable the applicant to continue earning well on his investment. And I think he already is earning well on his investment. I'd like to, I'm curious to know what he's charging these friends, uh, students who are there. Steve Schreiber, an expert on design and land use, he's demonstrated the shyness of the work being offered by the applicant. As an architect and former member of the planning board, he's shown the extent to which this project oversteps the intent of the exemption. And recently he even showed that this property has about the lowest possible rating of any structure in central Amherst with minimal investments in either the existing house or the garage structure, substandard design for light and ventilation. And the engineer's stamps on the drawing are erroneous. I, I, don't, I can't speak to the changes that have been made, but he said they're erroneous. Uh, the windows that didn't match the elevations, the arrows indicated water flowing. Okay, I'm not an expert on this, okay. So, but it seems to me it's about making a decision, an exception on a substandard, undersized, highly visible property. And, uh, you know, we don't see much evidence of the properties being approved, ex except for moving a park, creating a parking lot, which is not an improvement because it takes away the backyard. It's going to double the number of substandard structures on the property. And it really does stand out like a cancer in this, in a healthy neighborhood. Now, you know, the town can't compel the owner of 275 East Pleasant to improve the property now because a single family house is by right use. Two non-owner occupied houses on the same property are not by right. So this is the town's only opportunity to compel the owner to really improve this property. I want to say we, we have an attorney who provided solid case law, Mr. Reedy, to demonstrate the real baseline for assessing the damage a project on a butters and how this project clearly exceeds that standard on many counts. And the onus is on this applicant to demonstrate that the conversion of the garage is clearly similar in character effect of, the, of its current use, its current use as a garage for a single family resident. And I, we think that the applicant fails here. So given all these problems and the counterclaims of the applicant, we, we want peer review paid by the applicant chosen by the ZBA of all the materials submitted about the neighborhood character. I wanna just quickly speak to a few broader issues about this process. This is new, based on my own expertise in government and public policy. And by pointing these out, I'm not implicating any person. In fact, my argument is that there are structural problems that are no fault of this committee or staff, but I want the committee to be aware of them as they make their decision. First, the, the confusing zoning bylaws tends to benefit those with intimate knowledge of the process and who are willing to push the boundaries. These bylaws with a waiver clause are utterly confusing to the uninitiated. And so we, the residents, see these bylaws, it's like shifting sand with almost no foundation as we try to understand what it means for our neighborhood now and in the future. And meanwhile, applicants and their experienced consultants who know the staff, and there's no, no problem with that, they know exactly how to create narratives that appear to fit the exemption. And we're no match for this. And that's why we hired an attorney. We would be completely lost without being able to have the case law he's given to us to adjudicate this stuff. But even hiring counsel doesn't change the fact that the current set of rules are bewildering for us and appear like a constant invitation for loophole seeking. And they know how to work with staff, they chip away at the exemptions and it benefits the aggressive applicants over time. And it's, this is called policy creep, when governments enable applicants to pursue projects increasingly distant from original intent. And it's more likely, and it's no fault of this group, of this committee, with a written set of rules like here, when you know, there's a lot of turnover on this committee, like ZBA. And if you've been on the ZBA for five or 10 years, please consider whether you've seen waivers like this granted for such a substandard property in a neighborhood like ours, especially when there's a community so concerned about harm and without any support for the applicant. The second thing I want to say was that the Zoning Board of Appeals has a really commendable preference for fairness and accommodation. How in combination with confusing laws, it tends to skew outcomes towards developers because it's the nature of voluntary boards to listen to both sides. But investor applicants, they have strong incentives to push the boundaries beyond the original intent. 
And then they come back like Mr. Sparkle's doing, claiming to be accommodating by scaling back the project somewhat. And a voluntary board, they want to avoid one-sided decisions. They understandably don't want to have a heavy footprint in the process. But by splitting the difference with the most aggressive applicants, it again invites policy creep and it creates the perception of unfairness, even though this is the exact opposite, I know, of what this board is trying to do. So we understand students need a place to live. Our neighborhood has absorbed much more than its fair share, but we're at the point where it's, it's you know, we don't see what the public, if this was a public good, you would not see this outpouring that we're, 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 we're talking about these past several evenings, because it really is imposing costs on the communities, but we're willing to bear those. If, we, if our leaders tell us this is an important public good, this does not seem to be an important public good. In fact, it undermines the public good by incentivizing the removal of starter housing for younger families. So let me close by emphasizing again, my remarks are not, not, not personal criticism. I admire members of this committee. I've seen you ask great questions. I've sh you've shown amazing concern for all sides. And you really, I, you really take time to listen to us repeatedly. I, you want us to get out of here, I'm sure. Whether you decide in favor of residents or not, and from what I reserve, I would vote for all of you. But what I'm saying is we're talking about structural biases in this process that puts these neighborhood residents at a disadvantage. And so if you're deciding, as you decide, I know you're deciding on the merits of the case, um, for those of you on the fence, I just hope you consider how some of these underlying factors make our case much harder as you think about your decision. So thanks again. I appreciate your service on this committee. Thank you, Mr. Lavaja. Um, okay. Maureen, we have a telephone number, I yep. think. We do. Um, hello, telephone number. Uh, hi, hi, Maureen. This is Jeff Cobb at 6 Wildwood Lane. Oh, sure. Okay, continue. Um, so I've also, I'm on the butter uh, at 6 Wildwood Lane, and I, I have sight lines directly to uh, the property, and I have submitted written comments before, so you have those new, those are written comments um, in connection with the last presentation, so I, I won't go through all of those, uh, and hopefully I'll, I can make this brief, but I did want to um, just address a few quick points. One is, uh, I would... I disagree with Mr. Sparkle's comment about the driveway, the what we're calling the gravel driveway, and the turning radius and the garage. Uh, since the since the tenants were informed last time, uh, last being that they had to follow the parking rule because there's a parking plan there, they have since done that. And uh, if you've gone by, you've seen that they are now parking in the garage. That's a huge improvement on the safety of that area, there is now a full car length or more that they can see when they're backing up. So they're no longer backing up directly into people. By following and using the existing garage, just by itself, that's improved the safety. And just the fact that the garage doors can go up and down, all of that creates the, uh, the visibility to the person who may be a pedestrian that somebody is going to be backing out. So I think it just to me it defies logic a little bit that you would that we would consider taking away a garage when the garage works well when it's a single family and has limited parking and consider that the appropriate remedy is to take the garage away and then pave over the backyard. So I just wanted to make that point. Another point about the, the driveway, there I know there's been a lot of talk about the, is there a driveway? Is there not a driveway? Mr. Sparkle says, well the town says there's a driveway. Well I mean I've lived here a long time and witnessed that. And there has never been a real driveway there ever. That was, uh, Mr. Fair lived there and he was a woodcutter and, and landscaper. And he had a, he had a, at first he had no gravel down. He just used that because he had equipment back there. He had a trailer and equipment that he'd, he would use and load. And uh, at some time he, he put down gravel. There was some gravel there, but it was never maintained as a real driveway. He used it very infrequently, and he used it to go down to the basement level of the garage to load stuff and come up. It was never used by as a driveway. There were never any vehicles parked there other than equipment and trucks when he wasn't using it or loading it. He also had the wood pile back there. It was not a driveway that was used on a daily basis for the cars. The cars parked in the garage. So uh, we don't have a driveway there that was ever officially 
uh, designated or used as such. And before the fares bought that, there was no driveway. I just spoke to the former owners, the Keaties, and there was never a driveway there when they lived there. So um, I just want people to understand that. Um, the other uh, correction I want to make is Mr. Sparkle mentions that there's only been one special application. Well, that may be true, but there are a number of convert. There are a number of should say conversions, but there are a number of two families or rentals that had that had two families, and the conversion he's talking about at three fifteen, it's either three fifteen or three nineteen. It's Ulrich's home. That was a basement unit that's not visible from the street, and it's attached to the rest of the house. The garage proposed garage conversion would be taking <laughs> taking something that if it is used properly. Uh, is an attribute to the neighborhood and taking it away and uh, essentially creating a, a, a type of unit that doesn't exist in the neighborhood at all. It really just changes the character. And I'm very concerned because my backyard looks on my other neighbor uh, who has a three car garage with loft. Now he's, there's, there's a very nice person. I'm sure he's not going to convert that, but is somebody going to now buy that? Look at what, look at what Mr. Mendelson was able to obtain through his special permit and now convert that into that, that, that could be converted into many more bedrooms. It, it, it's a, it's a two-story garage with a lot of three, three, three cars. I'm worried about the creep and the change and the tipping point in the neighborhood. And I just, uh, I think 315 Ulrich's basement is completely different from a conversion of a garage, which would take that away and then pave over a park, pave over the backyard, which was always used as a backyard except for turning, occasionally turning equipment and vehicle. Um, so and the last comment I wanted to make is that, you know, you know, Mr. Sparkle mentions that the tenants, the current tenants are good, good tenants. Well, they have been following the parking plan and they only did so when they were, I guess, spoken to after the last meeting. Um, and I can't comment on you know, whether they're good or not, I guess, but I think the fact of the fact of the matter is they weren't following the parking plan and, and they may be paying the rent, but they weren't, I wouldn't characterize it as good if you're not following the parking plan for, uh, you know, for the rent, for the residents and the abutters. Uh, one more comment. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I think it's impractical to use Butterfield dorms parking lot <laughs> for weekends and parties. That was the suggestion. I mean, that's pretty full right now. Um, that's not a very practical solution and you have to get parking permit up there. And if there are student rentals as it is, they can get parking permit there. They don't need to park at the house. So I am concerned about the density, the different type of unit, the illusion that parking is somehow uh, going to be solved by uh, paving over the backyard. And I just think it's the wrong density. Uh, it's the wrong site uh, for that type of, uh, that type of extra unit. Uh, thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Okay, we now have uh, Bruce Carson. Mr. Carson, identify yourself. Um, one second, it, it takes a, a few moments here. Okay. Can you hear okay, me now? Bruce. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, this is Bruce Carson at 8 Strong Street. I live across the street from the uh, property in question. I just wanted to reiterate what my neighbor Jeff Cobb just said that this would be a very big change for the neighborhood because it would be two housing structures on a very small lot. The garage in question has a very prominent location on Strong Street and it, it would be a great departure from what we have right now. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Okay, uh, next, hold on a second. Next, we have Hilda Greenbaum. Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, yeah, so I'm speaking as myself, not as a reporter. Um, Hilda, just give us I, your, uh, uh, your address. I, oh, 298 Montague Road. Thank you. And I don't know how to say this. I've seen Bucky Sparkle's work and went to all the hearings of Amherst Media where the vegetation that was going to be planted there was all placed in a site with a name on it and how big it was going to be to try to make the aesthetics of, of 
what wasn't the greatest design look a lot better. I know Bucky can do really good work, but, and I've also watched very carefully what was required for um, Mr. Stutzman for an accessory dwelling, clearly a different part of the bylaw, but th that landscape plan for Mr. Stutzman had um, where the rainwater went to the gutters and how, it, how the drainage went down the yard into various swales ending in, in the wetlands area. And that lot also was sloped and, and was wet, I gather, from watching the hearing. But also he had a lot of plantings on that site that were listed by name and location. I don't see any of that here. And to quote a former candidate, it's sort of whatever he's done to that house is like putting lipstick on a pig. It's an ugly property. And if you can't make the property look better with proper landscaping or the garage really adds nothing by sticking two windows and a door in it, it's not an attractive. You're not gonna get the best tenant. And I have several years of experience in knowing how to screen tenants and find people who are gonna be compatible with, with what the landlord's aims are and keeping a nice house over the long term and not have to redo it after every tenant. But if you can't make it more, more attractive, you're not gonna get a good tenant. And I also think that you need to require, you know, what what are the what is the drainage off the roof? Where where are the, the, the gutters and the drain pipes? And what planting are you going to put there to make it a more attractive looking building? So you get a good tenant and not have to worry about the lowest quality party boy going in there. Um, these are the things that bother me. Just sitting here and listening to it as you listen week after week after week, but. As I said, I got a lot of experience in making old houses look better. And this is not one of the projects I would have taken on because I, I, I realized what need to be done to it, but that's what I want to say. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Okay, we have one more, Steve Schreiber. Hi, Steve. Hi. So I actually, I'm Steve Schreiber, 100 High Street, not speaking as a elected official, but I am speaking as an architect. And I've been uh, registered, in our, I first got registered in Massachusetts, 1985. Um, I served on the state licensing board for 10 years. And um, I have a real problem with the drawings that are on Mr. Sparkle's stamped drawings. So I don't, I'm not, I don't know the, the procedures for licensing engineers, but I do know in architecture, when you stamp something and when you present it at a public hearing like this, you are verifying to the public that it's accurate. So we've already demonstrated that the floor plans that are part of his drawings, that he's adopted into his drawings, are not accurate. They did not match the elevations. I have, still have problems with the elevations as presented that the windows uh, now seem way oversized. So they just seem random. And I believe that the, probably the um, owner is the one generating these drawings. Mr. Sparkle is adopting these as his own, but that's a huge problem. This is a very serious project that's in a very visible corner. And this sort of shoddiness should not be acceptable. So I'm gonna read you from your own rules, the Zoning Board of Appeals rules that you require preliminary skilled architectural drawings, preliminary architectural skilled drawings with a minimum skill one eighth inch, including typical floor plans, typical elevations and sections and identifying construction type and exterior finish signed and stamped by an architect. If one of the requested waivers is for relief from lot line setbacks or building height limitations, documentation, documentation shall include a street elevation showing the proposed new construction in existing buildings to at least 100 feet adjacent to the requested waiver area. This is what you require. You should demand this. You should not accept a home, you know, basically what you've been given. Um, I just, one other thing about licensing laws is that there's a huge exemption given in any licensing law 
for things that will only cause you harm. So I can cut my own hair, for example, but I can't cut somebody else's hair unless I'm a licensed barber. So, so um, the, the owner can design a house for that he himself will occupy because the harm that's possible from that will only cause him harm. But I don't believe that you should be allowing this applicant to be designing something that he does not intend to occupy. So the other thing, the other comment is regarding the housing market study. And I may have been the one that pointed this out. Mr. Sparkle um, quoted part of that, but really the gist of that is the housing crisis in Amherst, a large part of that is caused by um, basically a demand for what used to be owner occupied houses being bought by LLCs and by converted to rentals. That is very much part of the housing crisis. So there are a number of solutions listed in there and um, Mr. Sparkle mentioned the RN, so I'm gonna quote you another one from the RN. That's to amend the section in question to allow owner occupied two family houses as of right in the RN, as well as in the RG, blah, blah, blah. So this is a, not a, there's no proposal on the table for this, but there definitely is a concern in this housing market study about non-owner occupied multi, or, or more than one family on a property. And then the last question I have is, I'm the one that brought up the question of the property value. And Mr. Sparkle showed maybe a more recent one. I could not find that one online. So Mr. Sparkle got that somewhere not online, which is great, but he's introduced that into record. And I, I think you should verify that that's actually true. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Schreiber. Oh, we have uh, another um, attorney, Reedy. Mr. Reedy. Yep. Mr. Reedy, <clears throat> please identify yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of the neighbors. Um, I will keep it brief given the hour and, and my guess that you're going to continue this based upon what I've heard tonight. Um, I guess that's into Mr. Sparkle. Oh. I'm not right about anything, which I think that I'd probably ask my wife, but I think you all know me well enough. Take a look at the letter. Um, don't listen to me. Don't listen to Bucky. Listen to the neighbors. Trust your inst instincts. Trust your wisdom. Trust your judgment. I think Mr. Raja brought up a great point so to, to, to peer review. I haven't seen a photometric plan, and I know Mr. Sparkle will say, uh, you know, it's residential. We can't get it. I, I mean, I think the standards would dictate the thing. Stormwater peer review. All due respect. The as minor as it is, and the neighbors would feel comfortable if there was a stormwater peer review. Same thing with a photometric plan. Um, I know we also heard testimony analysis. Are strictly bad. Do you want? Uh, may I interrupt? I, I, is it just me that's having internet issues? Okay. I'm having trouble. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Reedy, you're, you're breaking up. I'm getting about. Oh every, no. I, yeah. I'm getting about. Could you, Tom? Here. Could you call in? Could you call in? Um, if you go to the agenda, um, and call in. Yeah. Let me try to call in. Yeah, it just keeps on breaking up. Sure. There was some really great stuff in there. <laughs> I'm sure. We're, we're sure. I got to stop the timer while he's calling in. Um, while we wait for him, I, there's a couple of things that um, we're going to want for the next meeting that I, I'd, I'd like to go through before Mr. Reedy comes back. One of those is the um, the, the parking barrier. I, not only do I want to, I think we should see it, but I think we need some kind of a evaluation of its safety. Uh, you know, I, it's it's it just is something I haven't seen in Amherst before. Is a three foot tall sort of barrier on the other side of the sidewalk that, and I'm. Number one, I'm not sure that that's how 
common that is and how to, what it does to the neighborhood. But I, I'd really like to have somebody take a look at that and say, that does help safety, it hurts safety, here are the concerns about it. It's just not something I've seen at all around Amherst. And I think it should be something that we at least should get a look at. And if the transportation department or somebody can, if there's some way to look at that and say, this, this has certain kinds of concerns or it provides certain kinds of protections for people, that would be helpful to me. So it's a sort of a unique thing. And I'd, I'd like to have that for the next meeting. Um, and then we talked about a bike rack. Can you get, provide what the bike rack would be and where it would be, Mr. Sparkle? Um, vehicle barriers, we've talked about. Um, photos, you're gonna ask about the photos of the renovations in 275A, get back to us on that. And the list of exterior work in A and the timeline for that work, you're gonna get back to us on that if, you can, if they will give you that information. Um, while we wait for Mr. Reedy, is there anything else that members have asked for that we need to have for the meeting uh, the next time we meet on this that I have skipped? And so if I'm hearing you correctly, you said uh, parking barrier image photo in evaluation of its safety. Safety and, or effectiveness or efficacy. I'm not sure. It's just- Sure. It, now, would you, is that something posed to town staff? Would you like, you know, our fire department and police department? And take a look at that, yeah. And, and perhaps, traffic. and yeah, yeah and our, our town engineer and inspection yeah. services, they could all right. weigh in. And then, um, uh, I guess, update the site plan and show a spec, uh, uh, design spec for um, the bike rack um, interior yeah building photos of the existing dwelling unit and a list of proposed improvements for the property um, for for the, uh, I guess, 2021? Correct. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, I yes. will say if, if you, if uh, I, I was just reviewing the list of, um, of requests uh, of, of the applicant um, that I sent by email to uh, Mr. Sparkle, uh, I guess the next, the day after, I guess on the 29th of, Jan of January. Uh, um, and I was just going through uh, all the items um, that he's reviewed tonight and he has addressed the majority of, of the items. Um, uh, there were a couple of things that haven't been um, addressed, which is, uh, review the management plan. Now, back in October, when this uh, application was first submitted and before Bucky was even associated with this project, uh, I believe um, Neil Mendenson did review the management plan with the board, but it might be helpful for the bo board to sort of have um, a refresher of, of that. And also um, there was a request to have a pioneer property services, the applicant, a representative um, that, that's associated with the company to give testimony to the board at tonight's meeting about um, the roles and responsibilities um, of their services and to have um, Pioneer Property Services provide a portfolio and explain staff levels for a property management company and and uh, um, I guess I think Bucky did touch on this, but uh, submit a resident manager scope of services and draft mm -hmm. agreement that will be used. So it does seem like we're running out of time tonight, but perhaps those items could be um, addressed at the next meeting. Bring me briefly. Is he back? Um, He's back, okay. Um, I see a raised hand. Let me. Right, I see one also from Mr. Waskevich and then Mr. Reedy and oh, then Mr. Sure. Sparkle. Mr. Waskevich. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify with Mr. Sparkle what the intention of the barrier was. If it's just to keep cars off the lawn, it doesn't have to be something that necessarily would, um, you know, it's it's more of a visual prevention as opposed to a physical prevention. 
Um, yes, actually, the, that barrier was a suggestion from the ZBA. It's not actually our proposal. It's our response to a request by board members to provide something to deter parkers from going into the front yard, even once the barrier curb is reestablished and the driveway is removed. There was some concern that somebody might still decide it's okay to park in front of the house. Um, as I don't know how often that happens in Amherst, but there was a, a concern by the board. So our response was we would put up something as a visual deterrent. Um, I just down the street watched a car drive through a house. If you wanna stop a car, you need a very, very big thing. And there's no way you can prevent a vehicle from careening off the road and parking in the grass if they really wanted to. Um, so it, it is just a visual suggestion um, and, and physics would not provide any reasonable means to prevent a car from um, jumping the curb and going into the, the yard if they really wanted to. Yeah, that's the reason for my question because we've seen cases where people have put up a split rail fence or they've put up large boulders. So what is the intention of this barrier? Uh, well, the, the functional intention is a visual deterrent, um, not, a, not a physical safety feature. And um, because it, um, it is an aesthetic issue that we haven't quite settled on that. And I understand that uh, the board is interested in us providing a specific detail on what that will look like. So I will talk to the applicant and see uh, if they feel a, uh, what would be the most aesthetically pleasing barrier that is uh, perhaps a little more substantial than a flower bed. All right. To answer your question, Mr. Orsevix. Yep. Yeah, I, I just did. I just want to make sure we're going down the right road here. Thank you, um, Mr. Reedy. Are you back? You... Uh, I think if 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 he is calling in from a phone number, I think he needs to press uh, star nine. I see a few phone numbers. Oh, uh, I see. I see a hand. Okay, we found him. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, um, okay, Tom, you should be able to talk now. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I will be even briefer than I was before. So obviously the, the board was going through a list of items that uh, they were asking from the applicant. Um, a, a couple of other items probably to add to that list, maybe an explanation of how they're going to enforce that tenancy. I know we talked about both um, 275A and 275B, and I think there was a request of the applicant, um, not even through his representative, but actually the applicant to explain how it would be enforced. Uh, I think Mr. LaRaja brought up um, peer reviews, and I just want to put a finer point on that, because obviously, you know, uh, Mr. Sparkle has presented what he has presented, Mr. Skeels has looked at it. Um, however, you know, I think to make the neighbors feel comfortable, a stormwater peer review, as, as minor as Mr. Sparkle may think that it is, uh, we would request. Same thing with a, a photometric plan uh, to get a sense of what that light bleed is going to look like. So there is on the back corner of the, the converted dwelling to be a floodlight. And while it might be downcast, uh, dark sky compliant, it is still going to project out to, to reach the far end of the parking lot. And so to see what that actually looks like. Uh, we would request. Same thing with um, the, the, the cars backing out. Um, you know, I, with all due respect to Mr. Sparkle, I, I don't know that it's that accurate. You know, looking at the photographs and understanding how vehicles work, I think folks may be able to back out of the, the garage bays of the garage without actually backing onto the road to, to face forward. Um, so to take a look at that and traffic as well. I don't know that a, a traffic analysis needs to be done. I know that the, the argument has been that there aren't additional um, vehicles there, but, but maybe something to look at. Certainly the stormwater, certainly the photometric. And then two questions through the chair to Mr. Sparkle. I don't know if we've seen a floor plan for 275A. Uh, and then also on his sheet 104 on his plans, uh, in his dimensional and zoning table, it says provided, and I just don't know if that's existing or proposed. 
Like if he's saying it's actually provided now or it's going to be provided once um, the project would be constructed. So just, just a, a clarification there. All right, thank you, Mr. Reedy. And what was that last point? Your, your last suggestion was on sheet, which sheet 104A you said? The, the first one, sheet one of four. Oh, one in, of in four. Mr. Sparkle's okay. dimensional table. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's probably I, a simple answer, but just for, for clarity. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. So I, we have, an, um, there's numerous things that we're looking for and I, and uh, the next meeting is two weeks. Is that right, Maureen? Maureen? Uh, so, yes. So the next meeting would be um, the fourth Thursday, which be, would be 25th of February. And the one after that is March what? March 11th. All right. I don't want to be in the same position that we're in tonight for when we deal with this the next time. And if we have, the, if we continue this to for two weeks, that gives only three days to get all to get this information together, get it to you for you to compile it, and then to get it out to us so that we have a chance to look at it. Given what happened with the mail this time, so I'm I don't want to put us in that position. I don't want to be in the same position that we are tonight, where we don't have the physical paper in front of us to make these decisions and to have all this information. So I would it'd be my preference that we continue this for for uh, till the second meeting, and I. I prefer that we, I would, if everything was perfect, I would like to be done with this sooner rather than later. I think it's in the best interest of everybody. This has been applied since October. And if they're going to go ahead with it, they want to get it ready before the, during the construction season. If we're not, if it's not going to be approved, they have a right to know that as soon as possible. But um, I think, but I don't think that we can be ready in two weeks and not have the same situation that we're faced tonight which is we don't have the paper. So I would propose that we um, continue this for uh, until that first meeting in March at that, and then and bring it up at that time. And before we, before we vote on that, is there anything else that people need to have inf answers to information, either answers to or information about from either the town or Mr. Sparkle, so we can be prepared to move forward and make some decisions. We have findings we have to make. We have the, we have we have to make findings. We have to consider the the um, um, conditions that we want to put on and what are those, how those findings affect that. And this being a complicated application, I think it will take some time to go through that whole process. But I'd like to I'd like to get that done in a month, and I'd like to have whatever you need need up for the town and for Mr. Sparkle to get back to us as soon as possible. Yes, Mr. Langstead. Um, I have um, several points uh, and questions that um, I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Reedy and um, maybe some of the, the neighbors. It has to do primarily with this idea that if granting this uh, application, that it would be a huge detriment to the neighborhood. Uh, and there are specific questions I have uh, regarding that. So my question is to you or for us, um, not wanting to go through all of that at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. is there a way that I can uh, crystallize those and send them to Maureen, who can yes. send them on, uh, so that we don't get into the, we don't go four weeks, and then suddenly I'm asking these questions and they haven't been thought about or addressed. I think that's, yeah, the answer is yes. And I think okay. that's one of the benefits of letting this go a little bit longer before okay. we come back, because it gives people a chance to to, you'll be able to read the material. And if, it's, if you've got a concern, exactly. you get the material tomorrow. Yes, right. Maureen. So if I'm hearing Keith 
uh, properly, uh, you have a list of questions or maybe comments uh, for the board to consider or for no. who to consider? No, for Tom Reedy and the- Oh, okay. So you could, uh, okay. So you could email it to me and then I could forward right. it along to the, right. to Attorney Reedy. Okay. And, uh, and then I, uh, and when would the board get a copy of this? The board would get a copy of this at the next meeting. Well, it would be, wouldn't it be like any other email that you would have with an applicant or, or, or somebody you, you well, have send an email and you put it onto the uh, OneDrive? So what I will do is I will post, um, I will post Keith's email on the town website. Um, so that all members of the okay. public can review that on the ZBA page. And I will tell everyone where they can find it specifically, but it will be on the CBA page on, yeah. So I, that we also have that, so members have that opportunity to raise those questions um, it, as you review the material and you have to do it as, I would encourage you to do it sooner rather than later the next couple of days. Absolutely. So we can get this all done and move on with making a decision and going through all the determinations we have to make in the next, next time we meet on this item. Great, thank you. So, all right, good. And anything else from board members? Ms. Parks. Are these plans adequate for uh, what we need? I mean, I, I for, for my short history on the board, normally we do have much more detailed plans and, uh, you know, not generated by, the person who's doing the building, but by, you know, licensed architects. I'm just wondering, I do, is that a missing here? I, I wish I could answer your question. Um, I, my experience is we took, my experience is the same as yours, Ms. Parks. We typically have a more, um, a more detailed rendering uh, and elevations, but not always, but most of the time we do. And I, I'd have to go back and read the, uh, the bylaws, or the rules of the, uh, the ZBA again to do that. I haven't looked at what our requirements are. Mr. Mora or, or Maureen, can you help us with that to answer that? I know in some cases we say that we leave it up to the, the, the staff to approve a building plan, a construction plan, and that our drawings are just, uh, uh, what we approve of sometimes is just, um, is, is is not very specific and it gets much more specific at the at the construction documents. But what do we need? What do we need to do? What do we need here in terms of detail? So this is really a decision of the board. Um, you know, the the plans uh, do not meet the uh, specific requirement in the rules and regulations. So you're, you know, you're waiving certain aspects of that, the architectural stamp. Mm -hmm and the, the number of details that are provided because it's an existing building really isn't all that unusual for the board to do that, uh, particularly for one or two family buildings. The, the building code doesn't require an architect to stamp those plans. So that's not really unusual. So, you know, there's no question the plans that are provided are, are not accurate to provide all the details, uh, you know, size of the trim and really what what the building looks like or will look like so it's really up to the board to decide if what's provided to you in the concept is enough uh clear enough for you to to base your decision on uh, or uh, possibly you'd need to ask for more details or uh, the next level quality of drawing uh, in order to do that um attorney bard would like to speak yes yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just supplement what Mr. Morris said by uh, simply reminding the board that some of the details, particularly, let's say drainage, planting and so forth, likely if you were to approve this, you would be approving it based on what you've been shown and what you've been uh, convinced to believe is gonna work. So you would need plans that will show that in some detail because your decision again were to be an approval would have to refer to those plans to say that this is what we're approving and if you're building your project this is what you have to build so you will want to be convinced that 
uh, the plans, the landscape plans, something particularly of the drainage, the uh, groundwater flow and so not the groundwater, but the stormwater flow uh, is shown at a great enough level of detail that it can be enforced to make sure it's built as it was described and proposed to you. Good, thank you. Does that answer your question, Ms. Parks? Well, it, um, it addresses my concern. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, um, I'm not, I, um, it, can we request of the applicant that we have, you know, a peer reviewed stormwater review, a photometric plan, a, you know, an architectural plan? We certainly can do the first two, if we wish. We can, it, it's uh, 50B, I think, is the... 53G. 53G, uh, I knew it was a higher number. 53, <laughs> 53G, where we, we get peer review and it's paid for by the applicant. Um, I don't know if that also applies to architectural drawings. I, I'm just not familiar with that, I, I don't know. We could certainly I, request, we could request, um, if, we, if that was the desire of the board, uh, more detail. Um, if that's if we're not comfortable with what we have now, we can request more. And that I doesn't just, need to be peer, necessarily peer review. I was I was just going to say that I share your concern about the uh, the amount of pavement in the backyard. Yeah. Um, that isn't there right now. And even though you it's a driveway, if you you know loosely a driveway, it's definitely not a piece of pavement. And so. Um, that is very concerning to me. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Langsdale. No, it's okay. I, I'm going to do it a different way. It's fine. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm going to do it in uh, Greek. <laughs> Nobody can ever say that these meetings aren't interesting. Oh, okay. We'll wait for, we'll wait for the we'll wait for the Greek from you. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Sparkle. Um, I have a prior commitment to a public hearing on March 11th. So oh. uh, I'm not going to be able to be available for that date specifically. I think this will just have to go further into the future. Um, that makes it March. Let's see here, March. Wait, um, whoop, uh, that's right. Uh, March 11th, the 25th. 25th. Yep. And I don't know if there's any other option. I think two weeks is too quick. Um, uh, I hate to put it off that long for the, the applicant, but um, if you can't be there, then we need to. And I think you're a required participant. So um, we need to do it on the 25th. Um, and uh, okay, sure. And right. I get. Um, I guess regarding this sort of notion or beginning to have a discussion about having a, a peer review for items, is this something that you yeah. as a board want to make a motion on tonight or is this something that you want to talk about in the future? Well, I don't, you know, I don't really know that we can talk. We either have to deal with it now or else we talk about it in the future. And we've been delayed the consideration of this thing out another couple of weeks while that peer review is done before we can um, um, decide. And so then we're looking at June or something, uh, excuse me, not March, April or May before we can make that decision on this. And that seems to be a long, so I think we should think about it right now. Um, and can we get an estimate of the cost of, can, can we get an estimate of the cost to the applicant of a peer review on the stormwater um, and, and how much that would be. And then how do we make, how do we, I've never done this before. So if we know you how actually much- actually have. Well, I, we have- oh, No, four. no, you haven't. No, you have not. Sorry. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. We, we've had a discussion about it before. Yeah. Okay. Well, we haven't done this. So I don't know if we can request that, if we need to have it done in a meeting, if we can um, authorize Tonight, authorize the um, exploration of how much it would cost, bring that back to the board and, and the board vote on it. Or if we can just say, 
Um, if this, if it's the, I don't think it should just be at the discretion of the chairman to do it, but can the board vote on it in two weeks? Um, just on that matter, I don't know how we do this. So, so I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to ask for a peer review without knowing what the, what the cost would be for the applicant. And it's not that it's a disqualifier, but I just want to know what I'm imposing upon the applicant. So I can, can I can light do, on that? What's that? I, I would be able to shed some light on that if you were interested. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, for for a full scale commercial stormwater review, you are looking at two to four thousand um, dollars in fees. Uh, if it is a, a more simple report, such as that I have presented, then it's it's quite variable. Uh, I'd be surprised if you were able to find somebody to take a look at it for less than a thousand dollars, partly because there are no standards against which they could review it. So they're going to have to come up with their own theories mm -hmm. and ideas. Um, uh, when I did peer review for the town of Amherst for stormwater management systems, which I've done in the last year, it was um, a more complicated system than this for certain, but not terribly. And that was roughly uh, an eighteen hundred dollar review. Okay. Um, well, that's helpful information. The question for us is, um, will you can staff go out and find a peer review, how much it is, can you do it in the next two weeks? And, and if you do, can we just make that decision to request it in two weeks? Can we, can we meet or can we put a, a time on the agenda just for consideration of, of the of ordering a peer review on drainage or on take if we want, without having to open up the whole thing, the whole um, application for discussion in two weeks. Mr. Bard, do you think we can do that? Sorry, y yes, uh, I believe you can. I mean, uh, what process did you have in mind? In my opinion, for instance, it would be sufficient for staff to talk simply to you as chair if, if the rest of your board is comfortable with that. And, I'm comfortable uh, with that if the rest of the board would be comfortable with me um, using my judgment or letting you guys, uh, I, I mean, that. I, otherwise we're having, having a meeting on this. Mr. Langsdale. I, I think that uh, what Mr. Baird has just said uh, is the way to go forward so that uh, Mr. Sparkle can come to you with uh, whatever he is uh, able to come up with and that you make the decision because I think it's um, I think it's Im important that we get forward with this either way in which either way that we decide finally but I think uh, to, to, to drag this out to four weeks and then beyond is uh, not why we're here right. frankly. So uh, I would I would personally say yes. Uh, you meet, talk with Mr. Sparkle, and and get everything. Let us know, and we'll move on to the next process. If people do not have an objection, let's let's move it that way on the stormwater. Um, Mr. Maxfield, you have a question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So we. Um that you can uh, authorize uh, whether or not that we need um, a peer review or, or I'm sorry, what exactly is it? Is that, I, that, that's yeah, that in order to move this process forward, let me find out how, let staff go out and judge how much, get estimates for how much is, an estimate for how much it's gonna cost. And then I let me make the decision as to whether it's um, reasonable. I think if it's in the thousand to $2,000 range, I would think, seem to find that reasonable. I would inform you of my decision. We would go forward with it so that we can be done with it, but I'd inform the board of my decision immediately upon making it. And if, you, if there's a huge objection, we can, we can deal with it. But um, that's the way I would like to handle it. Because otherwise, we're just gonna, if we have a legitimate question about this, I just don't want this to hold everything up for six weeks uh, in order to deal with this. Does that answer your question, Mr. Maxfield? Yep. Okay. Got it, Ms. Pollock. And I just wanted to clarify to the board what a peer review is um, in case there's any confusion. So a peer, and please anyone else that if I have a confusion that you correct me, is that uh, a peer reviewer is going to take uh, Bucky Sparkle's 
uh, stormwater uh, proposal calculations and design and review that. And that's what the peer reviewer would solely be doing. They would be uh, reviewing their peer who is Bucky Sparkle. Mm -hmm. So they're not creating a new design or new calculations or anything like that. They would be reviewing um, Mr. Sparkle's um, stormwater proposal. Mr. Meadows, you had your hand up. Just to, just to clarify, um, this would be stormwater photometric and architectural or? No, I, I didn't, I don't think our, I mean, I didn't move architectural. I think stormwater, I think photovoltaic are the two that make sense and they can be done pretty quickly. But we, no, you know, we can't do a peer review because we don't really have a, anything to peer review for photometric. We need a photometric set, that's a different I issue. But all we, all we can talk about here for peer review, I think is stormwater. I'd like to have that. <laughs> Photometric seems to make sense, but we don't have that. And I, uh, but there's, it's, there are limited numbers of lights. Um, people care about that I, a lot uh, on, the, on the committee. I know that, but I don't, and I don't think we should do a, I don't think we should do a whole architectural peer review. Of it. That seems to me to be too much. But so that's, that's my response to your question. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. Maxfield. Um, yeah, I guess I was just going to say my, my personal opinion is, is I don't, I don't really support at this time. Um, the need for a peer review. Um, I, I understand the timing that we're kind of dragging this out. And if we're going to do one, we should do one sooner rather than later. But I, I don't just, just over the last two weeks of, of kind of going through, uh, kind of public comment of, of what the issues with this project are uh, from what the, the public comment is of saying, you know, well, if there's, you know, the, the, the parking situation, hey, if that could be addressed, I, I, I'd support this project. If uh, there were a real engineering plan, I'd support this project. And, and just seeing that shift over these months that uh, no one has, has now come in favor of this project, even after those concerns have been addressed. And it just seems like this constantly shifting goalpost where now we're gonna impose a condition on the applicant here that they have to go get peer review. And then once that comes back to us and then maybe the peer review says, hey, this all looks good. And then and then it's, it's I, I, part of me feels like what's what's gonna be the next, the next goalpost and the next hurdle for the applicant here. So where it feels like, I, I don't know, if we're at the point where we're going to be approving this project or denying this project, it, it, it seems, I, I don't think it's appropriate for, for the board to impose what could be even a $2,000 condition on the applicant for an application that, that may not be approved. Maybe when we get to the point where we're really done with the public hearing and we're talking public meeting and we're really doing you know, our legwork of trying to impose conditions in here, while we're working through that process, maybe I might be more open to it. But, but at this time, I, I, I don't I don't support peer review. All right. Well, we have um, divergence of opinion within board members. So what I'd like there's only one way to solve that. I, let's have a vote on whether we uh, proceed to a, a peer review and whether um, the process where I will try to I'll work with staff to try to get a um, an estimate or of a peer review, make a decision as to whether to do it and report to you guys immediately as to what the cost is and what the um, what the peer the scope of the peer review. So I will, Ms. Parks. I just want to make a comment that you know in in a lot of ways I deal I agree with Dylan in that I don't I don't know that it will make a difference to how I'm feeling about this project. I guess I think it's it, it's more important to figure out what what we really need to decide to be able to make a decision about the project, and mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm I mean I said peer review because that's what I was repeating what other people were saying, but it's um, I guess I have a concern about the concrete level in the backyard, and I don't know if a peer review answers that concern. So. Um, well, wouldn't a peer review answer whether the, the peer review would answer whether the proposed hardscape provides 
uh, is sufficient for the, uh, the proposed hardscape exceeds the, the um, drainage garden, the area that is, is in the proposed plan. That's what we don't know. I mean, yeah. that's what we have. A, we have a plan on that. For some reason, I, I, it, it's, it strains my, my credulity that it strains credulity to me that it's, that it works. I'm not an expert. I'd like, to, and I know that that affects other um, neighbors. So I'd like to know something about that. That's what I'm concerned about. And I didn't mean to cut you off there, Ms. Parks. Um, I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I agree. I, I'm in this, I'm in the same frustrated place about it because I, I don't, it's like, I, I, yes, that's what I would like clarified. And I, yeah. I wasn't sure that the peer review was going to answer that. I didn't know if it was going to be someone saying, yep, that, you know, yes or no, or yes, these plans are fine or, you know, uh, no, this is not going to, I don't, I don't know what, what the result of a peer review is. So I, what I, I what I hope is that the result of the peer review is just what I described that it tells us whether the whether the proposed hardscape is going to exceed the volume of the the, the rain garden and for all intents and purposes that's what I'm looking for. Okay. okay. So then I let's have a vote on whether we should go, go forward with exploring and uh, engaging in a peer review. Um, is there a motion? to do that. I, I make a motion that we uh, go ahead with this. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? All right, uh, roll call. Chair votes aye. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? No. Mr. Meadows? That's an I, okay. The vote is four. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Vote is four to one. Um, so we'll deal with this. Maureen, I'll call you tomorrow and we'll set up a time to deal with this right away, okay? So, sorry, I just have a little sure. confusion. So, um, so the board made a motion and voted four to one to explore and engage a peer review uh, for stormwater. Um, and and so, so you're moving for, so you have actively said that you are going to move forward with this. And does the board need to make a motion about anything else um, about the cost or anything? Or can this now just be worked out uh, with? I, the I cost? propose that we, we just go ahead with it. I will report back to okay. the members, um, or if you do, we'll report back to the members of what what it is before we finalize the engagement and we'll go forward. How's that? So that being said, is this public hearing being continued to March 25th or is this public hearing being continued to um, February, uh, the next February meeting? Well, I don't think we February. need, well, that was my question earlier. I don't think we need to have, if we don't have to have a meeting to engage with a peer review, I'd like not to. If we can just go ahead and do it and authorize it through this but if you're, but, yeah, but if you're communicating with the board, about that is that it, during the public hearing if, if there no, no, I, does there need no. to be a discussion about the cost with the zba members that's my question or no i don't think so but mr bard can you help us with this yes yeah so mr chairman i i think we're going back about 10 minutes ago here so yeah. sorry um, sorry no, no no it's fine i think it's important that everybody be on the same page uh it, it's my view and i think the board members understand this that the board's vote just now was to authorize the chair to work with you and whatever staff you think are appropriate to find the right peer review professionals, whoever that might be, get an estimate from them, have a conversation. So it would just be a staff conversation with the chair and the board is authorizing the chair to authorize you uh, to go ahead and engage with the peers we're talking about you know, something on the scale of one or two or maybe $3,000, I don't know, but nothing more than that. Um, I mean, again, the, the chair is gonna, in his discretion, decide. And so uh, in the next communication with the whole board or, or as you post it or whatever, you can report when a peer reviewer has been hired, if that's the case. And if, when you get their report, make that available. So there'll okay. be no, no further need for board discussion of this until 
until the deed is done, if you will, till a peer reviewer has been hired, provided the report. Oh, okay. So I could, in an email correspondence to the board, say, this is the price or this is the consultant. This is what we've got. Yeah. Well, okay, cool. And Yeah. I mean, not the price. I mean, in other words, when you've hired somebody, yep. right, all of that at once. In other words, no need to keep checking in on it. You and the chair will make those decisions. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right. Thank you. So 926. Is there other issues that we need to discuss before we can adjourn to the next in, in two weeks? Do we have items on the agenda for two weeks, Maureen? We don't. We don't. We oh. don't. But we need to uh, officially uh, make a motion to uh, continue this public hearing right. till March 25th. So let's do that first. Um, and then we'll get to the motion from uh, the question from Mr. Maxfield. So, so I'm sorry, I was just making, raising my hand to make the motion. Make the motion to move it to the 25th, great. Let's move it along, I like that motion. <laughs> All right, and now I'm gonna like a second even better. Second. All right, I've got a second. Um, is there any discussion? No discussion. All, uh, I vote aye. Mr. Linesdale. Aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. All right, motion carries. Um, is there anything else that needs to be discussed? And we don't have a meeting scheduled for next week or for two weeks or no agenda. So Ms. Parks. I'm sorry, I just, I just wanna say that uh, there's comments about, you know, students, the number of students. It isn't the number of, it isn't students that are the issue. It's the number of people in a building. And, and when a whole lot of people are in a building, it tends to be students. And so I just wanted to, you know, um, Mr. Sparkle keeps talking about that there's a, it seems to be an issue against students. It's not against students. It's packing more people into those spaces. And I just also want to say, uh, address you saying uh, people, uh, students parking in the front yard, they do it all the time um, on many properties. So I'm done. I just needed to say. All right. So at present, we don't have an agenda. We don't have an agenda item for the, the uh, next end of, of February, the next meeting is in March then. And- uh, Correct. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Barr has raised his hand. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, and maybe I missed it, but I heard March 25th. I didn't hear a date for the continued public. Sorry, I didn't hear a time. Oh, oh thank you. Six uh, o'clock. That's can, by unanimous consent. Can I do this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, I should have said, my motion should have said six o'clock or Mr. Maxfield's motion should have said six o'clock. I think I heard him say that, but six o'clock <laughs> on the 25th. Right. I heard it. I, I heard it. We all heard it. All five of us. I am smart of it. Okay, so done. All right. Record of anything else. Is <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for um, your extended time tonight. Um, we do have public comment and items not on the agenda. I'm gonna open those up right now to see if there is any and then we'll adjourn the meeting. So this is the time for public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. We have nobody raising their hands. We're done and there's nothing on the agenda. So we are done. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Maxfield. Move. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we got a lot of seconds. All right. Vote occurs. I vote aye. Mr. Langsdale. Aye. <laughs> aye. <laughs> yes, aye, maybe. Miss <laughs> Parks. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Maxfield. Aye. And Mr. Meadows. Aye. All right. Motion carries. It's unanimous. We'll see you all in a month, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good night. Yep. Good night. Thank you, everybody.